Well, hey there, guys. Greetings and salutations, and welcome back to the channel for this installment of Open Mic, the show where the mic is open, the floor, as they would say, is yours. What are the things that you guys want to talk about? That is what we are here to discuss today. I'm, of course, your host, uh, John Campy. If this is your first time around an open mic, um, it's kind of like the John Campy show, but really it's just the more casual laid back part. We're just going to talk about stuff. We're just going to talk about movies, movie news, TV, streaming, all that kind of stuff. And we primarily focus everything on what you guys want to talk about. So there are two different ways to get a topic or question in for us to address here on open mic. The first way is to use the tip link, which is simply streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip. Uh, you'll find the link to that down below as well, if you want to, and that you can use anytime, 24 hours a day. Like if it's at midnight on a Thursday and a question pops in your head, you can send it in there. Or the second way, if you're watching live and only if you're watching live right now, you can use the super chat feature in the live chat and we We'll get to those topics and questions if they're appropriate to be used on the show uh, here on Open Mic. And it's good to have you guys here with me today. And yeah, we're not going to waste any time. We're going to just kind of dive into it here because I wanted to address this interesting article that came out um, in Variety that basically is talking about how Apple has spent $700 million dollars on Killers of the Flower Moon, Napoleon, and my beloved Henry Cavill's Argyle. And now that's production budget and marketing budget. Now remember, Apple said a, a while ago that they were going to be using uh, or be spending a billion dollars a year on theatrical films, right? A billion dollars a year on theatrical films. And... This just those three movies alone get them pretty close to that mark, right? Just that alone, getting close to seven hundred million dollars, right there, just on those three films. And I don't know if you noticed, but Killers of the Flower Moon did not exactly blow up the box office, and Napoleon didn't exactly blow up at the box office. And Argyle was certainly a disappointing film and did not do anything at the box office. Uh, now, one thing I do want to point out, there's a, there's a big misconception. Like people think, oh, $700 million, that's chump change to Apple. No, it's not. It's really not. See, everybody thinks Apple and they're like a $2 trillion company. But then they think that that means every division of Apple has $2 trillion. They don't. Every division has their own budgets that they got to meet. They have to make money themselves. And Apple TV Plus is its own thing. Apple TV Plus does not have $2 trillion. They have an operating budget and they have to succeed. They have to prove their worth. And even to a $2 trillion film, $700 million is not chump change. But Apple still considers it a success. Why? Well, the Variety article goes goes into that. I wanted to read this a little bit because I thought it was really interesting. <laughs> I love this Napoleon graphic. I nearly conquered Europe and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. I like that. All right. So this is what the Variety article says. When it comes to Apple's Hollywood ambitions, it's all about spending big to win big. On March 10th, the tech giant has 13 shots to take home Oscars. Basically, they got a lot of Oscar nominations and that's what they wanted. Apple wanted to be a big player. They wanted to make a splash. But at what price? Sources say the Martin Scorsese Helm Killers cost an eye-popping $215 million. That includes $40 million for COVID-related costs. In fact, Apple spent at least $700 million to make and market just three films, Killers of the Flower Moon, Napoleon, and Argyle. The trio have earned a combined of $466 million. Now, I'm no Harvard statistician, but... 466 million is not as much as 700 million. Not to mention the one third of the box office that theaters keep. And you're talking about massive, massive losses for those movies, right? Yes, but there's other things to take into consideration. Anyway, uh, worldwide box office, Napoleon Lee in the pack, 281 million. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Apple isn't complaining, though. 
At least not about Killers or Napoleon. A studio source says that both films are actually profitable, buoyed by auxiliary revenue streams. Both ranked among the 10 highest grossing films of the past year on the Apple App Store, with Killers holding the top spot for four weeks. It's too early to tell how Napoleon is faring on Apple TV+. Plus. It debuted March 1st, but Killers is off to a strong start as the most viewed film on the platform over its first 45 days of release, driving new subscriptions in the process. Now, this is where it gets really key. Unlike streaming rival Netflix, Apple sees the value of releasing films theatrically to raise their profile. How long have I been talking about that? Apple sees the value. I think this should be tattooed onto some movie studios. Apple sees the value of releasing films theatrically to raise their profile. Killers and Napoleon both enjoyed 58% peak U.S. awareness scores, according to NRG and Analytics, while Argyle had a 45% score. The company's brain trust believes that making Apple TV Plus the exclusive home for high awareness theatrical movies brings added value for the subscriber. Now... Why this is super interesting and really important is when you understand that Apple committing $1 billion a year to theatrical releases isn't about Apple thinking they're going to make their money theatrically. I mean, they're going to make some money. I mean, those, those three films alone made $466 million. It's not about they think they're going to make their money theatrically. Apple still sees themselves, uh, Apple TV at any rate, Apple TV Plus sees themselves primarily as a streaming company, a streaming service, right? And what's people like Rob and me and Chris been saying for a couple of years now and why Amazon is being stupid by putting Roadhouse just directly to Amazon instead of into theaters first? Apple gets it. What is it they get? They get the fact that by making these big profile movies and putting them in theaters first, the profile of those movies becomes infinitely higher. I'll tell you what, a lot more people would be talking about Roadhouse right now if it was getting a theatrical release, but it's not, so nobody's talking about it. Other than the controversy surrounding it, that's it. Nobody else is talking about Roadhouse. I'm still kind of excited to see it, but nobody else is apparently. So Apple knows their end game is the streaming service, right? So we make these movies, high profile, fairly big budgets. We put them theatrically. We make as much money as we can theatrically. But then they go to where, in Apple's mind, they were always intended to be on their streaming platform. But now instead of just being some, you know, obscure or rarely talked about project that's just going to slip onto a random streamer. These are big, high profile, dare we say, in the case of Killers of the Flower Moon and Napoleon, prestige films, not so much Argyle, but these are, they gain that prestige and now they're on Apple and they enjoy massive success on the streaming platform once they get there. So much so that even though Napoleon, Killers of the Flower Moon, lost money theatrically, they're more than making up for that on Apple TV+. Plus. According to Apple, they're now profitable. Not so much Argyle. I don't think our, even Argyle is going to be profitable once it hits Apple TV+. Plus. But again, this just goes to the point that, that I, I wish Netflix would learn, although in Netflix's defense, it seems like they're starting to learn this, but I wish Amazon would learn, and they kind of know this because they've done it before, but they're not doing it with Roadhouse. I don't know why, which is something we've been saying for years. If you want, if you're a streaming service and you want your streaming movie to do well on streaming, then put it in theaters first. Give it a theatrical run first, then put it on streaming because it's going to do a hell of a lot better on streaming if it goes theatrical first. And on top of that, you get to enjoy whatever bonus success. Because at that point, it's just bonus. You're going to enjoy whatever bonus success that, um, that you enjoy in theaters. It, it's just Apple seems to get it. And they seem, even though they're new to the game compared to Netflix and whatever, they're, they're a newer player in the game. 
Even though they're new to the game, they seem to get it better than most of the other streamers. And it's going to be interesting to see. Look, it is too early. It's too early to make any definitive pronouncements about Apple won and Apple got it and Apple's strategy worked and everybody else's didn't. So it's way too early to do that. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it's going to be really interesting to watch how Apple TV plus like continues to evolve. And if they continue on this strategy of spending a billion dollars a year on theatrical films that will then ultimately end up on Apple TV plus where they enjoy pretty good success, do they continue on with that strategy? It seems to be working so far. Will it have long-term success? I don't know. It's interesting. I just find the whole thing very, very interesting. But man, I, I'm telling you, when you read that headline, they spent $700 million on those three films alone. By the way, only one of them was any good. Killers of the Flower Moon was great. Napoleon, look, there are different opinions about Napoleon. I honestly thought Napoleon was dead boring, badly paced, and despite the fact that it had some great performances in it, it was just a really, really disappointing movie. Not the worst film of the year or anything like that, but really disappointing. And you guys already know how disappointed I was with Argyle. I was so excited for that movie. I love everybody involved. I love the director. I love all the cast. I just, I loved everything about that going into it. I was so excited. And uh, yeah, just didn't, uh, didn't quite work out the way I was hoping it would. Um, anyway, um, that's kind of my take on that. I, you know, we might actually, me and Rob and Chris might actually talk about this a little bit more on the John Campy show tomorrow. Th tomorrow's going to be interesting because tomorrow we're going to have me and Rob and Chris all on the show tomorrow. They're going to be coming in remotely, but still we're going to do that, uh, with all three of us on tomorrow. We haven't done that in a while, so that should be fun. And I think this is going to be one of the topics we talk about. So yeah, anyway, guys, with that down, Let's get to the whole reason why we are here, which is to take your topics and questions. Let's get things started off with the tip link questions that you guys sent in. And uh, we're going to start off here with Orange Hand, who writes, uh, Some people, uh, like Denis Villeneuve, say Dune Messiah works well as the end to Paul's story, but others say it works better as a prelude to Children of Dune, which is why the Sci-Fi Channel combined the two books into one miniseries. Let's not pretend to hold up the sci-fi thing as some <laughs> marker of excellence, though. Uh, I think I lean towards the latter. I Look, I've said this before. Um, I really don't think Dune Messiah works. At least as it is, because, again, I'm not going to go into spoilers or anything like that, but there are things that, a number of very big significant things that happen in Doom Messiah that are not fan-friendly. And I just don't know that the audience, no matter how good Denis makes it, I just don't know if the audience is going to get on board with it. Now, Denis already shown that he's willing to make changes to the book. He did. He made some changes in Dune part one and he made some significant changes in Dune part two. So, I mean, maybe he changes up Dune Messiah a lot to take out some of those things I'm a little bit worried about because honestly, I think if they just go along with the story of Dune Messiah, whether they do it as Dune Messiah or as a prelude to Children of Dune, I really think audiences as a whole are going to kind of get turned off by it. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Like things, some people saying things get wild in Dune Messiah and then they get even wilder after Dune Messiah. But I, I really hope Denis makes some significant changes because if they don't make some significant changes, it won't matter whether they do it as its own thing, as a conclusion to Paul's story or as a prelude to Children of Dune. It won't matter because I think they're going to lose the audience. But we'll see what uh, Denis got up his sleeve. All right, next up, Spidey Fan writes, one of two. At what point does Sony higher-ups finally say, Avi Arad and Matt Tomlock, we appreciate you being here as Spider-Man movie producers, but you are the constant thing behind our really bad live-action Spider-Man-less films. It's time for you to go. Eh. Uh, then afterwards, if Sony slash Tom Rothman want to continue to make Spider-related films, have a dedicated section um, of the studio to bring in someone with fresh eyes on how to give us better stories going forward, i.e. WB hiring gun for DC, much potential. So here, there's something you just said that I agree with and something that I disagree with. What I agree with is that I really do think Sony 
if they're going to be serious about this Spider-Verse that they have going on, both the animated and the live action side, then I believe they should bring in a definitive person or people to be a James Gunn-like head and a Kevin Feige-like head of it to be the overall guiding hand that guides everything that goes on. They haven't really done that, and I think they should. So on, on that thing, I completely agree. Now, look, I am no big fan of Avi Arad. All right. That, I mean, so let's just kind of be, be clear about that. I am no, if you've watched me for any period of time, you know, I'm not exactly a massive fan of Avi Arad. That being said, in the past number of years, what has Avi Arad delivered? He delivered an Academy Award winning film in uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. You remember when they won the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, it was him that went up with others, but he went up and is the one that got the trophy. He delivered a way beyond anybody's wildest wildest expectations smash hit in the first Venom, making over $800 million at the box office. Um, then he they delivered Venom 2, which I quite enjoyed and still made money. He, de they, he then delivered Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse as a producer, which was even better than Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And he did Morbius wah, wah, and Madam Web. Wah, wah. I mean, yeah, th there were those two. But the reality is, when you look at the stuff that he's been a producer on, um, he's got a winning record. And again, I, I take no joy in saying that. Again, I'm not an Avi Arad fan. But reality is reality. Um, he's delivered more wins for them than losses. I, and and that's, that's just the truth. That's just the truth. Now, I'm not saying then therefore they should keep Avi Arad around and he's the way of the future. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that it's way more complicated than some fans like to think it is. He's delivered for the most part. And he's, he's not totally to, um, he's not the one who should take all the credit for all those successes, nor is he the one who should take all the blame for all the failures. But I, I mean, look, the track record is a track record and it is what it is. So it'll be really interesting to see, but I agree a spider fan with that one basic premise that I believe they, I don't necessarily think they should create an entire studio like DC just did, but I do think they should have a division and just say, look, we're going to have, we're going to appoint a creative head and maybe that those creative heads should be Lord Miller. Maybe those creative heads of their spider verse should be Lord and Miller. And uh, they should be the ones in charge of it. I, I don't know. There's a lot of possibilities, though. A lot of possibilities. All right, next up. Dangerous D writes, have you gotten a chance to read Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong? No, I, I don't really have any plan to read it, to be honest with you. A limited run from DC Comics. It's as awesome as it sounds. No, I watched a couple of videos on it. Um, And I, honestly, I have no, like... What if you had the Justice League and Godzilla? I, I be, I'll be honest with you. That kind of stuff doesn't like Godzilla excites me. Justice League excites me. Crossover Godzilla and Justice League. I'm not going to lie to you. That doesn't excite me. It does. I'm not saying it shouldn't excite you or anybody else. I'm just saying it doesn't really excite me. So, uh, yeah, I did not uh, watch that, and I, I probably will not watch it or read it. I should say, I probably will not read it. Again, I watched a couple of videos on it. It's like, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Some of the stuff they're doing, but it doesn't really appeal to me, to be honest. All right. Next up, uh, we've got Luke S who writes one of three. Hey, John, it's been a long time since I sent you a question. I went to see Dune part two and I really liked it. I felt that the sets and cinematography were great. The action scenes were good. The performances were top notch, especially Zendaya, Austin Butler and Rebecca Ferguson. Although I felt that Florence Pugh and Christopher Walken didn't have much to do with their performance and their and their performances suffered. Oh, I completely disagree with that. Anyway, especially Walken as uh, the emperor, perhaps scenes got cut where they were more 
uh, present. If Dune Part 3 happens, then I think Florence Pugh would get to show her acting talent uh, for that character. Also, uh, it would be interesting to see how they would do a character who makes the cameo appearance in A Vision of Paul's uh, for... Uh, if they use the same actress, uh, final thought, I would have happily watched a longer version of this. Just some thoughts, bring on the filthy PS. Sorry. I thought it would be three posts, but ended up being longer. No problem with that. Luke. I listen. It's funny because a number of people have, have written into me and said that they totally love Dune Two, best movie of the year, all, all this kind of stuff. But if they were to point out a weakness, they thought maybe Christopher Walken. And I don't agree. I think the character was the character. And I think Christopher Walken, like I think a lot of movie fans sometimes think the actors make up their own lines and create when, when like if you had another actor in there, the emperor still would have been doing the exact same thing, saying the exact same things. But I thought Christopher Walken brought, brought a nuance to the character that was both terrible and fragile all at the same time. Like the fragility of his position was clear Yet the ruthlessness of him becomes clear as well. I, I personally thought the performance was great. If if I had issues with anybody's performance, it might have been Zendaya's. And even Zendaya's I thought was really, really good. It's just that whereas everybody else totally convinced me they were these inhabitants of this distant, faraway sci-fi future, sometimes Zendaya came across to me as like somebody from New Jersey. And, and sometimes she didn't and sometimes she did. But like overall, I thought she was good. I'm a big fan of Zendaya, by the way. Uh, and I know she's capable of really, really great stuff. It's just that uh, that would be my one criticism. And by the way, no matter how many scenes you get, the number of scenes you get as an actor does not affect your performance. Your performance should be at your top, whether you're in a 45 second scene or you're in 45 minutes of the movie. Your performance is your performance, right? Uh, the fact that you didn't have more scenes doesn't affect your performance. I don't think at any rate. So you're not alone. You're not alone, Luke. Like I, I've heard other people mention that they thought the Christopher Walken thing was a little shaky. I, I, I don't personally agree. Like for me, I thought it worked. But uh, yeah, that's just my take on that. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on it, Luke. Good to hear from you, man. All right. Next up, we go to A.K. Hamada, who writes, uh, been watching since the AMC days. Thank you so much. And it's my first time writing in. Good to have you writing in. Uh, but I had to acknowledge the sheer greatness of Dune 2. My local theater did a part one and two marathon. Nice. And it was an amazing way to experience the cinematic glory. Long live the fighters and long live cinema, my friend. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Ann and I did a in the, I think about two or three days before we went to go see that early fan screening of Dune 2. We sat down in our little theater room and watched Dune part one again. Absolutely had a blast with it. Absolutely loved it. And, you know, I, I don't know if some of you remember me saying this, but when Ann and I were driving home after watching Dune Part 2, one of the things we said to each other, I, I said to her first, I said, this is going to sound weird, but I can't wait for Dune 2 to be out of theaters and get on streaming so we can literally have weekends where we just do a back-to-back -back marathon. <laughs> And watch them back to back. Um, yeah, the movie, I, again, I think it might be the single best film I've seen in the last 10 years. I've I've never said that. Certainly not in, I don't think in my professional career, I don't know that I've ever said that. And, and I'm sure I did, but it's been a long time since I've even said that as a film fan. I can't remember the last time I, I thought to myself, this might be the best film I've seen in the last 10 years. Uh, but that's kind of how I feel about it. And and there are others who like it more than me. There are others who like it less than me. There are some people who don't like it at all. And that's great, but that's what it is for me, man. I'm glad you wrote in. Thanks a lot for that, AK. All right, next up. Uh, we got Dear Campia Love Doctor. It's been one year since me and my ex broke up. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about that. Uh, she's found someone new four months later and happy, and I just can't find anyone. All my friends are in healthy relationships and I feel kind of lonely. I'm, oh God, I'm 22 years old and it seems everyone taken. What should I do? Help doc. Okay. 22, huh? Now look, first of all, it should go without saying, um, that I am not a uh, certified therapist 
by any stretch of the imagination. And any opinions I give are strictly those of my own and uh, based on my own personal experiences. But dude, you're 22. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? You honestly, in my in my limited opinion, um, at 22, 22 is not the age to be thinking about. I need to find myself a healthy relationship. That that no, 22 is not the age to be doing that, man. You got you're 22. I mean, you're. I mean, I'll do. I'm not trying to say this as a as any sort of a put down or insult or anything, but dude, you're a kid. Celebrate that. Enjoy that. Listen, I was in my mid thirties when I met Anne. Let me repeat that. I was in my mid thirties when I met Anne. So imagine your age plus a decade. And that's when I met the love of my life. It wasn't until many years later. I mean, look, yeah, if you want to meet people, sure. I, I would say this too. I, I would say this. Um, uh, there's there's still some weird stigma with online dating. Before I met Anne, I, I was getting kind of frustrated with the dating scene a bit. And I decided, I had some friends convince me to try online dating. And listen, man, I had some wonderful success and some really cool... Um, I met some very cool people and dated some really wonderful people. Nothing that ended up being a long-term thing, but I ended up dating some really fun, wonderful women and, and stuff like that. I thought online dating was great. Uh, it's not how I met Anne, but yeah. But dude, honestly, if you're a 22, I, I don't, don't wor even worry about it. I would say don't even think about it. <laughs> Just focus on, you know, getting your education, having fun, you know, uh, doing the things that you want to do right now. I, I would, I would focus on that personally. And again, let me remind you, I did not meet Anne until I was like, not quite mid thirties, but, but into my thirties until I was into my thirties, I didn't even meet Anne. So, uh, yeah, Robert puts it best, man. Listen, be a kid and have fun, man. Just have fun, dude. Don't, don't you worry about uh, that other stuff again. That was, that's just my take. That's just my opinion. I'm, uh, I'm no expert, but that's what my thing would be. And anyway, dude, and by the way, understand this. I would say this to any guy or girl out there. If you th see yourself as being any kind of incomplete without a significant other, then you're not ready to be in a relationship. You, you've got to get yourself to the point where you, you realize you are complete with or without somebody else in your life. I mean, have good friendships, have good relationships, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, having some romantic partner, if, if you think that is needed to complete you or, or having a romantic partner fixes something, then frankly, you're not ready, I don't think, to be in a relationship. You got to be in a place where you are enough on your own that you, that a relationship is something that it becomes additive, not something that repairs you. You know what I mean? So that would be my kind of, uh, that would be kind of my thoughts on this. Not that I know anything. I mean, so take, take everything I said with a total grain of salt. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up we have, uh, Gomer, the ancient writes, John, you've recently been saying Man of Steel invented the idea that uh, the Superman symbol wasn't an S, but rather a Kryptonian symbol. Uh, might I suggest you give the 1978 Superman a rewatch? Pretty sure Reeves' Superman addresses it with Lois back then. In the original Superman, listen, I've seen the original Superman probably about 20 times, but admittedly, it's been at least 15 years since I've watched it. I don't recall um, Reeves saying that the, the S is a symbol for hope. Like, I don't remember that. Like he might be saying it's a symbol of the house of L or, or something like that, but I, I don't remember that it's a symbol that means hope and what I don't remember that, but it's been a beat since I've seen the original Superman. So don't hold that against me, but you might be right about that. You might be right. But, but I mean, traditionally post 1978, 
it's not really been talked about a lot. Like it's it's just it's it's just assumed. You ask anybody on the street, what's on Superman's chest? The letter S is what everybody will say, right? So um, whether it's referenced in the original Superman, not, and I have no reason to doubt you. I'm just saying I don't remember it because it's been a good 15 years since I've seen it. Um, you might be right, but but it doesn't kind of change the point that most people out there they don't think of it like they think of it as a big. It's just the big letter S on there. All right. Uh, next up. We've got, but thanks for sending that in, Gomer. And uh, again, I, you're probably right about that. Uh, the Tick writes, one of two. Hey, Johns, apology up front. I will be deliberately vague to avoid specific spoilers for others, just in case, no problem. Actually, I appreciate that very much. Anyway, I never got your extreme dislike for multiverse. Personally, I like them. Um, as to me, they opened up creative ideas and concepts. Uh, but... After a recent franchise I loved has fully leaned into multiverse, I'm planting my flag in Camp Campia, a story I was really enjoying rapidly devolved into nonsensical, convoluted runaway train wreck of mess and robbed me of my inv emotional investment. Um, that was very vague, Tick, but you made your point well. For those of you who don't know really what Tick is referring to, I don't like time travel in movies right? Because literally there is no problem you can conceive of that can't be fixed with time travel. To me, time travel is a lazy device to use in, in storytelling. Now, that being said, even though I don't, in general, I don't like time travel in movies, there are certainly time travel movies that I do really like. Obviously, Back to the Future I'm not a big fan of Back to the Future 3, to be honest with you. But, but, but obviously, the first Back to the Future, for sure. Star Trek 4, The Voyage Home. Um, there are a couple that, that I really do like. Um, and that should be true of anything. Just because there's something you don't like doesn't mean you shouldn't be open to having some exceptions that you do. But yeah, in general, I don't like. I also really don't like multiverse very much. There are obviously exceptions, yes. But to me, multiverse is nothing but the ultimate lazy man's writing device that, that sucks away consequences um, that suck, sucks away weight from any potential story. Now you can get into the semantics. I'll just give you an example of this. You can get into the semantics of, you know, Oh, was, you know, an end game. Was that like, is that a multiverse sort of thing? It, it is kind of, but like, for example, you have this moment in Infinity War. And again, I love Infinity War. And I really like Endgame. I don't think Endgame's nearly as good as Infinity War, but I really like it. It's quite, it's, it's, it's a stunning spectacle. But in Infinity War, you have this powerful, emotional um, end to the character of Gamora, a, a character we had been following for years and she dies at the hands of Thanos. You know the scene, emotional, Thanos has got a tear. And he throws Gamora slow motion off the cliff. Oh no, I'm falling. With this powerful orchestral music. She's falling to her death. Oh yeah, don't worry about it. We're just going to bring Gamora back. No. Timelines, multiverse, whatever. It doesn't matter. It just, it completely like cut the knees out from this powerful moment. Now that doesn't change the powerful experience I had when I first watched infinity war, but it certainly affects me now when I watch infinity war again, because you get to that scene, it's like, eh, it, it's, this scene is actually nothing. There's nothing to feel emotional about because in the very next movie, we're going to load up. She comes back. I bet you, you see, it's not really her. It's an uh, alternate uh, timeline dimension of her. It's her. It's Gamora. I don't care how you want to dance around it semantically. Yeah, shoot, Gamora's back. And and I'm, I don't mean to just pick on the MCU for that. It's It's been true. Like, almost every time multiverse is used, it is just a, a cheap way. It's like, well, wait a minute. Like, cause when you're not using multiverse, right. And you're trying to come up with something incredible and, and heavy and something that, that carries consequences. I'll use my beloved sons of anarchy, for example, right. That has no multiverse In sons of anarchy. You just can't go, you know, what'd be fun in this scene. If, uh, Opie 
gets shot in the head and dies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, what are we going to do with Opie next week and the week after that, right? In multiverse stuff, you can just do whatever. There's no consequences. You don't actually have to think it through. You don't actually have to put real weight into anything. You just do whatever you want. I'll kill him this week because we'll just bring him back next week. But in, But when you don't have that nonsense, when you don't have that out, I remember watching Sons of Anarchy and Ope was my favorite character on that show. And when Ope died, when Opie dies in Sons of Anarchy, and for any of you going, oh, spoiler, this happened like eight years ago. If you haven't seen it, you, 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 just, you have no right to complain. But anyway, when Opie dies in Sons of Anarchy, it emotionally crushed me. It gave me, remember, movies and TV shows are supposed to be experiential events. The experience that created for me was, was such shock and horror and, and emotional. I was sad and all that kind of stuff because this isn't a multiverse story. He's gone. There's an actual consequence to this happen, happening, which means Opie is now gone. There's no writing back next week. A time portal opened at the clubhouse for Sam Crow and Opie from Earth 275-B comes in. And now Opie's back. No, Opie was gone. And that's why, like, when like that happens, it's so much more powerful. Now, again, that's not to say that there, there, are, there aren't movies that have multiverse that I don't really enjoy. I do. I, I certainly do. It's just that. When I find out something's going to be multiverse, I just think, oh, so they were too lazy to actually write a real story with real consequences and real stakes and real weight. They just want to be able to do whatever they want to do and then be able to do, do just bring everybody back the next week through some, you know, horseshoe sort of thing. I don't know. And again, that's just me. I don't expect everybody to agree with me on that. I certainly don't. It's just a, yeah, a little thing of me. And I don't know which show or movie you're talking about, Tick, but I have found that to be true for me a lot of times. Anyway. All right. Colin C. writes, I listened to your episode uh, where you spoke about Dave Batista wanting to do more superhero films. For those of you who didn't know, Dave Batista said, hey, listen, man, I'm not done with comic book movies. I really want to do comic book movies, but I, I'd like to have a, a weighty character, maybe even a villain, right? Uh, anyway, I'd like to know what hero slash villain y'all would like to see him play. For me, as soon as I heard his comments, I immediately thought of the Martian Manhunter. Really? I don't see that at all. It's an interesting one. Um, you know me, I'm not big on X actor and X role kind of questions. Um, I, I think with Dave, who I adore Dave, right? I, I have, I've gotten together with Dave on several occasions, um, I, I just find him to be one of the most real guys I've ever interviewed. Like, like his attitude, I just love his attitude. His attitude is like, listen, I'm, I'm no world-class thespian. I'm super blessed to do this for a living. So I'm going to give it everything I've got every time I do it. And there's just something about that attitude that I, I just love. He's, he's just such a, he's just, I, I hate the term salt of the earth kind of guy, but it really does kind of strike me as that with, with Dave at any rate. I don't know that I see him as a Martian Manhunter or anything like that. I know a lot of people like to see him as Bane. I could totally see him as Bane. Um, I I mean, I've said before that I could see him as like a KG beast. I think he'd be really good as that. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't know. I, I Again, I don't like playing the X actor and X role games, but... Let's just say this. I fully expect that we'll see him in the DC world at some point. H him and he and James Gunn have such a good relationship. James Gunn loves working with him. He loves James Gunn. So I think at some point we'll see him. That, and you know what? I'll be happy for him, whatever role it ends up being. All right. Next up. An anonymous viewer writes, Saw Dune 2 twice and noticed a mistake. When learning to ride, Paul's eye protection magically puts itself on. Yep. I've no, I noticed that the very first time I saw the movie, like in one shot, he's got his face covered, except his eyes cut away to a wide shot and then cut away, then cut back into a tight shot. And then he's got the goggles on. And I mean, you could say while the 
camera was in the wide shot, he grabbed his goggles and put them on. And then we went to the tight shot. You could do that, but it certainly comes across as an edit mistake it, it, or a, not an edit mistake, a, um, a consistency mistake, right? As a script supervision mistake. Somebody should have caught that. All right. Next up. Noms viewer also writes, I just came out of Dune at the Tyler. Uh, it was amazing that gas when I, when he used the voice and the ending left me wanting more. Yeah. Listen, that's my, that's kind of my home thing. When I still lived in Burbank, when Ann and I lived out in Burbank, um, I, Ann and I would, our, our kind of main theater to go to was the AMC Burbank 16. Now that we live out in Riverside, uh, the, our theater of choice that we go to is the AMC Tyler Galleria in, uh, and it's a great theater. It's a wonderful theater. Anna and I love going to it, uh, in Riverside, California and, uh, yeah, and really have a good time there. And I'm glad you enjoy it, man. I'm glad you enjoyed it. All right. Next up, we got uh, Gabriel who writes, by the way, oh, that must've been the anonymous person, by the way, love the Tyler AMC. I love in, pa I live in Paris and would happily travel a bit to see more films there. Yeah, it is a really good film. I've been to Paris, by the way. Um, I've gone camping in Paris. Paris has a campground at Paris Lake. I think it's called Paris Lake. And, uh, I've gone camping out there. I really like it. I, I had a good time going camping out there. Actually, I was just thinking today about maybe going camping out to Paris Lake again. But yeah, AMC Tyler uh, Tyler AMC is a really good theater. I, I enjoy it quite a bit. All right. Glad you had a good time, Gabriel. Next up, Logan writes, I can't help but to think how much John Schnepp would have loved Dune 2. It's, it's absolutely true. Uh, given it's one of the greatest sci-fi movies ever made, bring on the sweaties. Uh, how do you think his fandom for film... Uh, well, sir, how do you think his fandom for film would be his reaction? I, that sentence doesn't make any sense. How do you think his fandom for film would be his reaction? Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, Schnepp would have loved this film. I mean, this, this was totally his kind of movie. And you know, it's, 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 it's been a couple of years now. But I still, Rob and I were talking about this the other day. Uh, I still find myself once in a while when coming out of like a great comic book movie or a great sci-fi movie, um, it doesn't happen every time, but I still find myself once in a while thinking like, Schnepp would have loved this. Schnepp would have loved this. Um, and that's, that's a thought that comes around my head uh, a lot. So yeah. Yeah, he would have loved it. 100%. Uh, Schnepp would have loved this movie. All right, next up. We got uh, Aaron, or pronounced Aaron. Thank you, Aaron, for putting in the pronunciation. From the UK, writes, uh, Robert John, I'm from the UK. Where can I buy Dune 2 merch slash collectible slash Chani action figure, et cetera, from? Also, was not a fan of the quick fight between Brolin and Batista. I was. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know what? I can't, sorry, I can't go into it because that would be a spoiler for how that goes on. Going to leave that alone. As far as where to buy merch from, no idea. Your, your best bet is to, um, like, uh, and I don't know that Rob would be able to answer this either because normally the places Rob buys stuff from, their stuff doesn't come out until like six months to a year after the movie comes out. The best thing I would suggest, Aaron, is to do what everybody else would tell you to do, which is just do a Google search. Yeah, just do a Google Google search and see what you can find. Like a lot of it hasn't come out yet. Like a lot of the stuff that will be out a year from now isn't out right now. But see what is out there. Just do a quick Google search and you should be able to find some stuff. I hope you find something good, man. All right, next up. Uh, Dirty Mother Towson writes... I've seen part two twice and I'm absolutely obsessed. An interesting box office stat that bodes well for part two is that part one's total box office was 433 million with 25% domestic and 75% international. So far, part two is closer to 50-50 and should surpass part one's domestic total shortly. Yeah, I mean, it already had a fantastic debut. What, what did they say the debut was? 82.5 million for its opening domestic weekend. Big numbers. Now, of course, one of the, the factors that went into that 25% domestic for part one and 75% international for part one was the fact that part one got released on HBO Max on the same day that it went into theaters. Um, and 
that and that was more because not every international market has HBO Max, so that was more relevant to America to American uh, audiences. So I think I think um, we're gonna see this one do really well. I again, like everybody was saying before, do you think Dune Two could be a billion dollar film? No, I don't. I, I've been saying now. I hope it does. That would be awesome if it does. I would love to be wrong about that, but I see it. 600 million, 600, 700 million is what I see it doing. Uh, I would love for it to be more than that. I hope it does more than that, but I, I think six or 700 million is going to be a huge win spot for them. Uh, and anything more than that would just be hyper gravy. All right. Next up, uh, Sharon from Israel writes, I love your podcast. Thank you so much. Dune 2 is horrible. Zendaya rules. All I want is that Chani will break up with Paul and rule the world. Well, I got some bad news for you. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, listen, I always say on this channel, all film is subjective. Just because something works for a bunch of people doesn't mean it has to work for you. Film is art. It hits us all in different ways. And if Dune 2 didn't work for you, Dune 2 didn't work for you. And that's okay. <laughs> all right. Next up, Caleb Jacobs writes, uh, Sting just retired from professional wrestling. I was eight, by the way, I was stunned to find that out. Cause I thought he retired years ago. Anyway. Um, I was eight years old when I first started watching him wrestle. I am 42. Now he went out undefeated and as a tag team champion with Darby Allen, I don't know who that is. I have three words for Sting's career in my life. Thank you, Sting. Yeah. Listen, Sting. I never followed Sting a lot when I was younger because when I was younger, I was primarily a W at the time it was called WWF. I was primarily a WWF guy, right? So I was, I was watching when I was a kid, I was watching the likes of, you know, you know, in the era of Hogan and Andre. And then, you know, right around that time, the attitude era started with, you know, rock and stone cold, Steve Austin and triple H degeneration X and all that kind of stuff. I didn't really follow the other promotions very much, but Obviously, everybody knew who Sting was, particularly anybody who was a wrestling fan. And then I was at the WrestleMania in San Francisco. Ann and I and a couple of friends, we drove out to San Francisco. That was a long drive. But we drove out to San Francisco to go to WrestleMania where I believe it was Sting versus... It was Sting versus Triple H, right? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think at that WrestleMania a few years ago, I think it was Sting versus Triple H uh, at WrestleMania. And that, like, you knew you were kind of, if you were a wrestling fan, and even at that point, I was only watching wrestling once or twice a year, but you knew you were kind of watching history, right? Um, and uh, that was really cool to see. He has been one of the big stalwarts of professional wrestling for decades, ever since I was a kid. And I just thought he retired a long time ago, but well-deserved retirement. He'll, he's a first ballot hall of famer for sure. All right. Next up, James LH writes, Hey John, I'm not religious, but when a film like Dune 2 is out and you watch it multiple times, are you like me thanking the cinema gods? For me, I'm thankful for Cineworld Unlimited. For you, it's AMC A-list. Financially, I would be lost without them. Yeah, listen, man. I, I, it's... I said this with Dune 2 when I first came out. It's the, and I only say this every couple of years. Every couple of years, I'll come out of a movie where I'll go, this is the kind of movie that's why I love movies. And Dune 2 is definitely one of those. And listen, as, as much of the um, criticism that I have for AMC theaters and particular their uh, incompetent CEO, Adam Aaron, in my estimation, in my opinion, a, an incompetent CEO uh, who's been doing a lot of damage to that company, just my opinion, and other mistakes that AMC has made. Um, I have always contended that the AMC A-list program is the best value offering to movie fans anywhere. Like for like 20, I think I'm paying $23 a month now, 23 bucks a month. I get... Any three movies a week, no upcharging for Dolby Prime, for IMAX, for 3D, 23 bucks a month. I get three movies a week. So that's 12 movies a month with 
discounts on my sodas. I still accumulate points and get credit. I got, I probably got like 45 bucks worth of credit on my AMC rewards right now that I can just go in and get anything I want. It is spectacular. Now Regal has a really good one too. The Regal unlimited only Regal unlimited is not, not really unlimited, but it's good. You get X number of movies. If you want to see an IMAX or a 4DX or a 3D film, you do have to pay a two or $3 upcharge. Whereas with AMC A-list, you don't, but it's still a really good value proposition there too. So there's some really good stuff out there. And I, I think more and more uh, people should really take advantage of it. Because all you got to do is see see two movies a month and you're, you've saved money. Like the average, the average Dolby, AMC Dolby Prime movie I go to, the average ticket is about 14 or 15 bucks. So if I just see two Prime movies, that's saving me, that's 30 bucks and I only paid $23 for my membership that month. I, I've already saved seven bucks. Then if I go see a third or a fourth or a fifth movie, which I often do every month, then I'm really saving a ton of money. And so it's it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful program. I'm sure one of these days, Adam Aaron will find a way to screw it up. But for right now, it's fantastic. All right, next up, Dangerous D writes, uh, you were talking about the fake AI image of Corn Sweat as Superman. Uh, now that there's one with Trump where he's hanging out with some black voters, it's a problem. Yeah, but I think he's the, I, I, look, I, I, I didn't really follow it, but I, isn't, isn't the Trump campaign the one who put out that image? Anyway, yeah, the, the AI images is going to become a problem. It's not just for movies, no, but I, I kind of focus more on one when it's about the movie industry myself. All right. Tree Limbs writes, uh, love Netflix's take on Avatar, uh, talking about Avatar The Last Airbender. A friend mentioned to me a funny but great idea. Say a Netflix Avatar season three, Team Avatar is watching themselves for a play, and the Ember Island actors are the same guys from M. Night's movie on stage. <laughs> Good or bad idea? Uh, it, no, they, they would never do that. Plus, I think a lot of people wouldn't even get the joke because I think a lot of people have never even seen that movie. But um, I would certainly think that would be funny. But no, they uh, there there's no way the people involved in it would ever do it. So there's no chance it would ever happen. But it would be funny if they did that. All right. Next up, we've got... Uh, save legends of tomorrow who writes, I wonder about the future of the Dune film franchise as the novels got more complex and bloody weird with each new volume. Oh yeah. They, they like went really not so, I mean, how the hell would you adapt God emperor of Dune featuring a 3,500 year old half sandworm son of Paul Atreides? Look, uh, I only read, I, I think I only read up to Dune Messiah. I don't think I ever read Children of Dune. I watched the, the Children of Dune adaptation. I didn't get it past. I didn't go all of the other pendencies, but I've read synopsises of them. And they're like, they get really wired. Wild, especially when Herbert's son started taking over the writing. Not that I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it gets really, really wild. Again, I just really think even with this next film, with Dune 3, Dune Messiah, I think Denis has to do some major adaptation and make some significant and, and don't care if the book Puritans get their panties all in a twist. Don't care about that. Care about the, the movie going audience. And I think if you're going to make a movie of Dune Messiah. I think they got to make some significant changes. And then listen, Denis Villeneuve's already said this will be the last one he does. That three will be the last one he does. He's not going to do any more, uh, but that doesn't mean Warner brothers won't want to do more. And hopefully they, Understand what the audiences will love and will not love, but uh, we'll see. All right. Uh, Quise Williams writes, 100% agree with you that the final battle uh, shouldn't have been longer. Duncan Idaho says himself in part one that the Fremen fight like demons and there's no better fighter in the Imperium. Part two certainly pays that off, especially um, as they were coordinated. 100% agree, but I cannot go... I can't go into it. I can't sit here and, and talk about it because there are still people who haven't seen it. And so I can't go and break down like what happens and, and why it's important and stuff like that. I can't do that, but hundred percent agree with your assessment there. Uh, Williams. All right. Next up. Uh, daddy J sends in a $20, uh, tip. Thank you. Daddy J who writes, um, 
Hey, John, been a viewer since the AMC days. Thank you so much. I just want to share a pet peeve of mine. Uh Oh, here we go. I find it frustrating how much you love and praise Turning Red. Oh, it's brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. Should have won the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, no doubt. I simply can't stand what a basic clipboard plot it has, uh, yet you love it so much. Please stop it. Bring on the filthy. Listen, just because you fail to recognize how great it is, that doesn't mean I should change how I'm doing it. By the way, I'm pulling your chain here a little bit. Listen, if it didn't work for you, that's fine. If it didn't work for you, that all movies hit us in different ways. It doesn't matter how much I recognize and acknowledge how great Turning Red is. That doesn't mean you need to feel the same way. Not at all. But it is brilliant. It's a wonderful, heartfelt, warm, charming, funny, just delightful film that, you know, all movies are are experiential events, right? And, and Turning Red just delivered such a wonderful experience. Uh, my wife is absolutely in love with it. It's just utterly fantastic. It's an utterly fantastic film. And if any of you haven't seen Turning Red yet, I highly, highly encourage that you do. Um, again, no film is a guarantee that you're going to like it. Like to everybody who hasn't seen The Godfather yet, many people consider it to be the greatest film of all time, but that doesn't mean you're going to like it. it. It all hits us in different ways and that's perfectly fine. But uh, as for me, oh yeah, it's a, f- shouldn't say this about a Pixar film, but it's fucking awesome. It, not not their best, like not not uh, a top three greatest Pixar film of all time by any stretch, but it's it's a fucking wonderful movie. I, I absolutely adore Turning Red. All right. And I'm going to keep talking about it, Daddy J. All right. Thanks for writing in your thoughts, man. I appreciate it. All right. Next up, we got Anthony who writes, Denis Villeneuve reportedly has a quote unquote secret project that uh, that is time sensitive. This is a big reach, but with how Dune Part 2 is doing great in box office and reception, it's a no brainer for WB to go after him to do a live action adaptation of Akira. But one, one doesn't equal the other, Anthony. One does not equal the other. Here's a frustrating thing that we as film fans, and when I say we, I include myself in this. Believe you me, I do. What we as, there's a frustrating things that we as film fans do, and it always happens. Like when the Dark Knight movies were coming out, every movie, everybody started saying, Christopher Nolan should direct that. And then another movie would come up. Christopher Nolan should direct that. And then another movie would come up. Christopher Nolan should direct that. When the Lord of the Rings films were going on, every movie, I remember at the time, like every movie that would be coming out or is being talked about, everyone would say, Peter Jackson should direct that. Peter Jackson should direct that. Peter Jackson should direct that. And in the, in the last little bit, like everything is like, Denis Villeneuve should do that. Denis Villeneuve should do that. Listen, Denis Villeneuve doesn't have to do Akira. And I think after doing Blade Runner 2049, I, I think stylistically, and, and now working in the world of Dune, I see him doing things like, and he's going to do another Dune film. I see him doing more films like, say, um, uh, oh, I, I uh, uh, why did I just freeze on the name of it? I just had, I was about to say, Passengers? No, not Passengers. Um, uh, guys, the, the, the one with Hugh Jackman and, uh, and Jake Gyllenhaal. Help me, help me. Why am I freezing out? It's like a, a one word. It's bleh. And I'm forgetting the name. Why am I free? I was just about to say it. It was in my head. I was about to say it and then I froze on it. Guys, what's the name of that movie? Anybody in the live chat? Prisoners. Is it? Yes, Prisoners. Thank you. Thank you. I think what Denis will do is go back and do a film like Prisoners, something like that, because he's got another Dune thing to do. I don't see him doing Akira. Now, let me be clear. If they were to announce tomorrow that a Denis Villeneuve was going to direct an Akira, I would be very excited about it. But if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to be excited about any movie they announce that Denis is going to do next. Like you could say he's doing the next Garfield movie and I'll get excited about it because it's Denis, right? So, um... Uh, I mean, no, I don't like what Equity just wrote. Better than Taika. No, 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 no. He's not better than Taika. They make very, very, they have very different sensibilities when it comes to their films, right? Like, I'll be honest with you. I don't, as as he might be, Denis might be the best filmmaker in the world right now. I know it's, it's a big argument between him or Christopher Nolan, but I think there is a solid argument to me that Denis Villeneuve is the best filmmaker in the world right now, possibly. But that being said, uh, Denis couldn't, I, I don't think Denis could make a film like Hunt for the Wilder People. I don't think Denis could make a film like Jojo Rabbit. 
and and I don't know that Denis could make a film like what we do in the shadows. Like it's just that it's a very just like I don't think Taika could do Dune, and I don't think Taika could do The Arrival. They're very very different filmmakers with di very different sensibilities. Um, and I'm glad they're both there. I'm glad they're both there, and that they're both working, and that they're both making the types of films that they make. On the hierarchy, do I think Denis Villeneuve is like more the guy right now? Yes, but I wouldn't be throwing out things like, well, Denis better than Taika. Well, I mean, Taika's awesome. I mean, I didn't like Next Goal Wins and I wasn't all that thrilled with the latest Thor movie. But I mean, Jojo Rabbit is like a breathtakingly beautiful movie. What We Do in the Shadows is one of the best comedies in the last decade. Uh, Hunt for the Wilder People is wildly underappreciated. The work he did on... Uh, um, uh, the Mandalorian was wonderful. I, he's great. Taika is great. But yeah, De Denise is doing, but they make very, very different things, right? So I, I just think that's important to keep that in mind. All right, next up, we go to Murray Reich. Who writes, while I appreciated seeing Dune 2 in AMC Dolby and seeing the grand cinematography, performances, sound, music, score, etc., especially a sucker for sci-fi movies, but like the first movie, I didn't love the second, but I still appreciate Denise's movies as a filmmaker. Hey, listen, man, there is nothing wrong with that. I mean, not every movie is for everybody. And every movie hits us all in different ways. I'm sure there's a, couple, a lot of movies, Murray, that... We both like, but you like more than me. And I'm sure there's a lot of movies that we both dislike, but I might dislike more than you do. Um, so yeah, that's all perfectly good. Like not everybody is going to watch The Godfather and think this is the greatest movie ever. Not everybody's going to watch Dune 2 and think this is a masterpiece. And the people who do think it's a masterpiece are not wrong. And the people who don't think it's a masterpiece are not wrong. They're just expressing what their experience with it was. And that's perfectly good. And so, and I thank you for sharing your thoughts on that, Murray. All right, next up, uh, we've got another one from Murray. He writes, I like the new AMC ad after the trailers, but the new Nicole Kidman ad, while it's changed up, I still can't stand it. Yeah, me either. And the latest Ghostbusters trailer is so bad on rewatch, it makes me cringe. Uh, felt like it's a bad SNL skit. Uh, listen, I love Ghostbusters Afterlife. Loved it. Um, I thought uh, they surprised us with it at CinemaCon. They gave us a big early screening for it and they didn't let us know it was coming. They surprised us with it and I absolutely fell in love with it. I, I, I got to tell you, man, the marketing for this new Ghostbusters, I know a lot of people are excited for it and that's great, but the marketing for this new Ghostbusters movie has not really done it for me. Um, and, and but but like a lot of people have liked the trailers, like D's in 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 the live chat. He likes the Ghostbusters. I listen. I've heard from a number of people who really do like the trailers. That's awesome. I wish I was one of them. I really do. Um, and and who knows? Maybe this next one will be just as good as Afterlife. I hope it is. But so far the trailers. And by the way, look, I I, I agree with you, Murray. That new AMC ad where you got that that guy and that girl, and then they're in different genres of movies as they're sharing a Coke and whatever, that AMC spot. It's it's pretty good. It's I, I'll give it that. It's pretty good. But I still don't understand. In a movie theater, and a lot of them do this, where we are forced, like we're told, movie starts at seven, but they lied. The movie doesn't start at seven. At seven, we start playing trailers. Oh, and not just one or two. We play like 25 minutes of trailers. Like as long as some episodes of Ahsoka, we play in trailers. And then when the trailers are done and you think, okay, thank God we're going to start the movie now. Nope. Now we're going to show you this ad for AMC theaters, even though you're already sitting in an AMC theater. Oh, okay. So they play this new ad with the guy and the girl, and, and it's a clever, cute ad. But again, I'm already in AMC. You clearly don't need to show me a trailer or a commercial for AMC theaters. Okay, then that ends. And you think, okay, now, thank you. Let's start the movie. Nope. 
Now the new version of the Nicole Kidman AMC commercial plays. And you're like, oh my God, I want to gouge my eyes out. This is excruciating. Especially when you go to as many movies as I and some of you do. And I got to watch these same two commercials for AMC five times a month. And I have said this before. Some of you have told me that that doesn't, that's not a good comparison, but yes, it is. Showing me a commercial <clears throat> for two commercials for AMC theaters while I am sitting in an AMC theater is likened unto asking a girl to look at my Tinder profile when I'm in the middle of having sex with her. That's how much sense that makes. Showing me two commercials for AMC theaters while I am sitting in an AMC theater is likened unto me begging a girl to look at my Tinder profile when I'm already in the midst of rubbing nasties with her. It makes no sense at all. And all you're doing is wasting more of our time. You told me this movie starts at 7. It's now 7.30 and I'm watching Nicole Kidman on my screen. And no, no disrespect to Nicole Kidman. I love Nicole Kidman. Absolutely, I do. But yeah, it just <clears throat> makes no sense. And by the way, Regal does it too. Cineplex does it too. I've seen other movie theater chains do it too. It's just very, very frustrating to me. Anyway, please look at my Tinder profile. All right, next up. I don't have a Tinder profile. Can I tell you the truth? Can I tell you a story? Anne's going to kill me for telling you this story. Shh. All right. <laughs> I don't think I've ever told this story. So one day, Anne and I were, uh, were going to bed and we like, we always like, you got to understand Anne and I laugh a lot together like every day we make each other crack up. Like I just, and, and is not just my wife. And, and a lot of people will say this and to varying degrees of sincerity, but I mean, I, I mean this wholeheartedly when I tell you this, like, Anne is my absolute favorite person, like anywhere. Anne is my absolute favorite person. I love her. So like, she's just the best just to hang out with. She is the best person anywhere to just hang out with. I hope forget relationships. I just hope you guys have somebody in your life that you just like hanging out with the way I love hanging out with Anne. She's hilarious. I love her. And we, we, we make each other crack up. So like we're laying in bed and we're cracking up, like whether we're showing each other articles or funny pictures or just making jokes or whatever. And I can't remember what started the conversation, but, uh, the topic of, of Tinder comes up, right? This is a couple of years ago. The topic of Tinder comes up. And we, we we're starting, I can't remember like what got into it. Like one of our friends was using Tinder. So we're going, blah, blah, blah. It's like, like, what would you even do on Tinder? I don't know. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, is it weirder for guys to be on Tinder? Is it easier for girls to be on Tinder? All this kind of stuff. And for, I don't know how it got to this, but Ann and I decided to have a competition have a little contest, a little competition. Um, and we decide, okay, let's each create a Tinder profile. And here's the parameters. And we'll just see how many, what, whatever it is, is like, what was it? I think you had to, you only got notified when you and somebody else were a, like, you didn't get notified when somebody liked your profile, but you get notified when you and somebody else both liked each other's profiles, something like that. And we say, let's put up a Tinder profile for like three days. We'll both like like 50 profiles and then we'll see which of us get as, get more, mutual likes, right? It's like, all right, yeah, 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 let's do that. Let's do that. And we, we made up some, some fake stuff and we, we decided what our fake stuff would be and all that kind of stuff. And, um, we put up the profiles two days pass. Remember we each went through and liked 50 other people's profiles. When it was done, <laughs> I think 
you know, I looked down and I had like six mutual matches. I'm like, that's pretty good. I might win this thing. I might win this thing. And Han got like 47. And the other three, I'm not sure they even checked their their app in the in the 48 hour thing. So yeah, I got I got uh, I got thoroughly trounced in that, which just goes to show you, I don't care what women say. I don't care what women say. I'm sure dating for women is hard. I'm sure for women, finding a good, decent guy can be very challenging. I, I've I've no doubt about that. I've no doubt about that. And I can't count it. I can't say anything wrong about that because I've, I'm not a woman. I've never experienced that. So I'm sure, I'm sure there's a great deal of validity to that. But don't you tell me that dating for men is easier. It is not. It is not. In our little contest. Now, look, I'm no, I'm no magazine model, but I'm not a sewer chud. At the same time, I'm okay, right? I'm okay. Look at this face made for radio. I'm all right. Yeah. It's, it, it, it is not easier for men out there <laughs> because men, you, you got to like, you got to be a peacock, man. You like, it feels like if you're a guy, like every, it feels like everything in a guy's existence. Me and my buddies used to talk about this in college. It feels like everything about a guy's existence is nothing but a desperate attempt, at least for heterosexual guys, is nothing but a desperate attempt to attract a woman. Like, we want a good job. Why? So we can attract a woman. We want to be in shape. Why? So we can attract a woman. We want to have a good haircut. Why? So we can attract a woman. We want to make money. Why? So we can attract a woman. It seems like every aspect of a man's life is about with one goal in mind, trying to attract a woman. And I, I, I don't know. It's, it's funny. I heard this one female comedian once who opened up for uh, uh, Mark Ellis. Cause I've gone to a few of Mark's shows and you guys remember Mark Ellis. So there's this one female comedian uh, who was who was on the same night as Mark Ellis, and she told this one joke. She was like, you know, me and my my boyfriend talked about like what you got to do to to uh, if you want to get sex, and he said uh, the guys got to do this and got to do this and got to do this and do this. She goes, me, I don't know, I just got to wake up. <laughs> like, and I'm sure that's a far drastic oversimplification. What the fuck do I know? I'm just a guy. I can only speak from a guy's perspective, but it's, it's, it can be tough out there for guys. It can be tough out there for guys, right? Anyway, anyway, let's keep on going here. Not that I know what I'm talking about. Not, not even remotely in the least. All right. Next up. Uh, what are we at here? We're at the Joe D who writes, Hey, John, my wife and I sat down to watch Shogun last night. That's a good choice. Uh, while what we saw looked great, it was so hard for us to keep up with the subtext. I, you probably mean captions, right? You, you probably mean ca captions. Uh, we couldn't follow along and got lost. I think we'll wait for the dubbed version, bring on the filthy. You know, listen, that that is a, you are not alone in that. Like, that's why there's a lot of Americans will not see foreign films not because I don't like foreigners. It's it's because I think there's a lot of Americans who don't watch foreign films because they don't want to read their way through a movie. Now, I don't know if it's just because I've watched so many um, captioned films, subtitled films, that I don't even really notice it anymore. Like, I'm able to follow along and, and read the dialogue and still keep, keep up. I mean, yes... Sometimes when your eyes have to be at the bottom of the screen reading the text, you can't catch every facial expression of the actor. There, there's a bit of a drawback. 100% there is. I don't disagree. But for me, it, I still get 99% of it, right? Like it, it doesn't bother me so much. But for some people, the experience is a little bit more distracting, I guess. And I can understand that. You know, it's funny because I was talking to a friend of mine um, who was saying that um, um, you know, let me get this straight in Shogun, they speak English and they speak Portuguese and they speak Japanese, 
But when English is being spoken, we hear English. And when they're speaking Portuguese, we hear English. But when they're speaking Japanese, they speak Japanese and we have to have subtitles. Why do you think that is? And I said, well, because I think they know, I think the folks over at Hulu know and FX know that if Portuguese was being spoken and we had to have subtitles for the Portuguese as well, then 95% of the show would be subtitled, right? As it stands, only about half of the show is subtitled, but like it's a very small percentage of the show where the characters are supposed to be speaking English, but then there's a big chunk of the show where they're supposed to be speaking Portuguese. So they made the creative choice that when they're speaking Portuguese, we as the audience hear English and we don't have subtitles. And that makes sense. But yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, I, I get it. It's subtitle stuff is not for everybody and to some can be distracting. I, I'm not going to hold that against you, man, because I, I, I think I've heard a lot of people say the same thing. That's not the case for me personally and a bunch of other people, but it is for others. So no big deal. Wait for that. I don't know if there ever will be a dubbed version, but maybe there will be. All right. <clears throat> Next up. Uh, Brian O'Connor writes, John, do not let House of Ninjas slip through your fingers. It's such a brilliant show. Imagine if The Incredibles was about a family of ninjas instead of superheroes. 10 out of 10 show for me. I've heard very good things about it. I haven't had a chance to, to, to start watching yet. I want to finish Avatar The Last Airbender first. I'm only like two episodes in now. So I want to finish that up first. And then my next priority besides Shogun, which is only coming out one episode a week, is going to be House of Ninjas. I'm going to get on that here soon, Brian. All right. Next up, an anonymous viewer writes, have you seen High Rollers D&D &D videos? I'll be honest with you, I've never heard of High Rollers. Uh, videos with the main cast of Baldur's Gate 3, uh, where they play D&D &D together as their characters. That's kind of cool. It's really fun, quite long though. Uh, yeah, I've, I've never heard of High Rollers, and that's certainly not anything they should take offense at, because I'm sure they've never heard of me. Uh, I've never heard of them, but I, you guys know I love Baldur's Gate 3. I love this game, and I'm a D&D &D player. So... That sounds like something I would definitely like to check out. Thank you for putting that on my radar, man. I appreciate that. All right. And our last question from the tip links, and before we take a quick break here, comes from Gregor. And Gregor writes, Hey, John, love the show. Thank you so much. I love Dune 2 and IMAX. I watched all three trailers before the movie, and I felt it gave away the best visuals of the film. Ooh, I disagree. Uh, do you think trailers diminish the movie experience, and would you consider abstaining from trailers? No. No, not at all. I, I do not at all feel like trailers um, diminish a movie experience whatsoever. I also would never abstain from trailers. Listen, I, you guys have heard me say this a bunch. Mo going to a movie is an investment of time and money. Just like buying a new watch or I got to get this hooked up. I got a, bought a new mouse, right? the, uh, the MX Master uh, 3S for Mac, but I got to get set up. But that's an investment of money. Um, the phone you have is an investment of money. And, and, and the most precious commodity we have is time. I believe movie consumers should be like any consumer. We should be educated consumers. We should make careful choices about what we invest our time and money in. And only you can decide if a, a movie is right for you to give a shot to. But trailers should not be the only thing. I, I think critics, uh, a lot of people, nobody cares about critics. Yes, they do. You might pretend you live in some weird world where they don't, but it's absolutely important that they do. And, um, and trailers, you should also recognize, are just corporate pieces of propaganda designed to manipulate you into going to see their movie. I, I love trailers. There's still great value in them, but make no mistake, a trailer is a piece of corporately produced propaganda designed to manipulate you and me into giving them our money to go see their product. So they it shouldn't just be trailers, but trailers is a part of it. And so, no, I would never be... I would never allow myself to be a poor consumer that way where I don't watch trailers. And listen, <clears throat> um, I, I never find, even if I see something in a trailer, when I watch it in a movie, like for example, I'll just give you, we're talking about Dune 2, right? In one of the trailers, we see Paul 
saying to the mother superior, the reverend mother of the uh, Benny Jesuit, saying, silence, right? And I'm like watching that trailer going, ooh, so good, right? right? But that didn't take away one slightest ounce of the thrill I got watching it on the big screen when it happened in the movie. Didn't take away one slightest bit of the experience for me. I knew that was coming. Yes, I'd seen in the trailer. Yes, but when it happens in the movie, when it actually happens, nothing is taken away. For me, at any rate, nothing is taken away. And I, I got to disagree with you. I don't think all the best visuals were shown in the trailers at all. I think some of the really best ones were absolutely. But again, and I'm only speaking for myself, your experience may be different. Um, but I really don't think seeing something in a trailer takes away any of the experience of it. When we do see it in sometimes when it's a joke, like jokes are a little bit different because jokes, if you know the punchline, the, 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 the laughter response might be diminished a little bit. I'll, I'll give you that. But most other stuff I don't find affects me once I watch the movie, but you know, that's just me. All right, guys, listen, we are now going to move over to your live questions. Those of you guys who've been firing in questions live, we're going to go over and get to those. But before we do, I'm going to go refill my drink, rest my voice for just a quick minute, give you a chance to maybe run, use the bathroom, talk amongst yourselves. And as we do, we're going to hear from the sponsor of the John Campia channel this week, our friends over at Factor. We want to take a second and thank a sponsor of today's video, Factor. You know, guys, some days it's great to prepare your own meal, but some days it's great to have wonderful, delicious meals already ready to go. Factor's delicious, ready to eat meals makes eating better every day easy. Wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre prepared, chef crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. You'll have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition packed add ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel good week of meals ready to go. They've got snacks, smoothies, and more. Discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day, like breakfast, midday bites, and more. And guys, you get to save. We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. So guys, head to factormeals.com slash campia50 and use the code campia50 50 to get 50% off. That's code campia50 at factormeals.com slash campia50 to get 50% off. And thank you to our friends over at Factor for sponsoring today's episode. All right, guys, with all that down, let's now move over to start taking your live questions. I've seen some people asking, uh, are the Super Chats still open? No, they are, are not open. Uh, anymore the super chats are closed because they filled up really fast uh but now let's get through the questions that you guys who are watching live have sent in here shall we okay we're gonna start off with tim who writes june shows house of the dragon acolyte the boys i'm telling you man what a month it's gonna i'm gonna be spending a lot of time in front of my tv man in june i cannot wait for all of those shows really excited i've been especially excited for acolyte i can't wait for that to get here all right Next up, we got John Redcorn who writes, hypothetically speaking, if Black Adam was good, say made $700 million and got fans excited about DC, do you think The Rock and his team would have been the heads of DC or would WB still have chosen Gunn regardless? They still would have chosen Gunn regardless. That was a pipe dream. Dwayne, I know Dwayne Johnson made a move. And now listen, I'm a big fan of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. You guys who've watched me for any period of time, you know how much of a fan I am of Dwayne Johnson. There was no reality in the multiverse that Dwayne Johnson was going to be given control of the DCU. No chance. It wasn't going to, it was never going to happen. And one okay success, like 700 million, that's a success. That's, that's great. It's not a billion dollar film, but it's a success. That wasn't going to change. They weren't going to go, let's work our whole future around the one pretty good success of this one movie. Nah, it, it was never going to happen. Never going to happen, John. And I say this as a huge fan of Dwayne The Rock Johnson, but it was not going to happen. All right. Next up, uh, Cinema writes, 
Have you seen the trailer for the new DreamWorks film, The Wild Robot? Uh, I don't know why, but I think it's my most anticipated movie for the rest of 2024. We talked about this briefly on the John Campy show yesterday. It wasn't one of our topics, but we talked about it a little bit. It is a very charming trailer. But I, that first teaser, I, I can't get that excited about it because I have no idea what the movie's even about. Oh, there's a robot and it's really cute and it's in the forest with some cute animals. And listen, I was totally charmed by it. Completely charmed by it. I told Chris Carr the moment she came in the office, I'm like, you are going to love this trailer. You, you should watch it. It's totally a charmer. But I, I have no idea. I have, it d- didn't tell you anything um, about what the movie was even about, right? Didn't tell us even remotely what the movie is. I can't get excited about something just because, okay, yeah, that looked kind of charming, but any good trailer company can make something look charming. I, I need to know a little bit more before I get totally excited about it. But yes, it's a very good first teaser trailer. I am very curious to know more. I, I, I It looked pretty good. All right. Next up, uh, we've got Wesley Cunningham who writes one of two. So that bizarre Wonka scam featured this creepy mystery character called the unknown ghoulish figure in a black robe and mask, literally no known connection to Wonka lore. A studio wants to make a horror movie about it. What the fuck is happening? I have no, I'll be honest with you, Wesley. I have no idea what we're talking about. I have no idea what we're talking about. Does anybody know what Wesley's like? What bizarre Wonka scam? I have, I, I am not like Elvis, Elvis C is saying what? <laughs> like, uh, King Daddy Goat is saying I'm lost. I, I, I've, yeah, I, I'll look into this a little bit later, but as of right now, unfortunately, I have no idea. Now B4B is saying Glasgow Wonka event. I had no knowledge of a Glasgow Wonka event. Um, somebody saying the Wonka event that made the news. I am not aware of it. I'm not aware of it, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, Wesley. I wish, I wish I was able to give some intelligent commentary on it, but I don't know what we're talking about, unfortunately. All right. CJ Rebirth writes, enjoyed Emma in Poor Things, but I almost tapped out because it was too much filthy for me. Also, episode three of Shogun is my favorite so far. How do I dive? Harimoto. I loved episode three of Shogun. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Um, hi, Tolonagasama. Um, it, the dive scene, yes. The the running, the blockade. All, it just, I adored it. I loved it. Emma Stone is brilliant. And she, I, I still think, even though it's, it's, too close to call. It could go either way. I still think Emma Stone is going to win her second Academy Award uh, for poor things. And I'm I'm sorry, CJ. You lost me at um, there was too much filthy. Too much filthy for me. I can't relate to that. I can't relate. It's like saying. The oxygen was too pure. I, I I don't, I know, I can't, I can't. There was too much happiness. I, I can't, I can't relate. I love filthy. Uh, bring on the filthy. Bring on all the filthy. Uh, I love filthy in movies. Now, now, here's the thing. I don't like gratuitous stuff in movies. Like, I don't like gratuitous violence. By gratuitous, I mean, I mean, there was no purpose for it to being there. Like everything should serve something that the director is trying to accomplish. Like that, that it's important to this story that a certain feeling is heightened here and violence can do that, can heighten that particular emotion or feeling or experience or whatever. Gratuitousness is when something's just thrown in there just for the sake of being there. In poor things... There's a lot of filthy, and I love. I'm not. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I could pretend, but listen, look, look. I am like every guy. Any guy who tells you they don't like filthy is kind of lying. But, but at any rate, 
particularly in while there is a lot of filthy in poor things, it's a, a, a fundamental part of the movie is built on that, right? It's, it's important. So it's, I didn't find any of the filthy to be, um, um, all the filthy I found, none of the filthy, I should say was gratuitous. Now, CJ Rebirth saying it just made me feel uncomfortable a little bit. Well, that would all depend on who you're watching the movie with. Cause if I was sitting in that movie theater with my mom watching, uh, poor things, I would probably feel pretty uncomfortable too. I will hundred percent agree with you. Or, you know, if I'm, if we're just out with a couple of, if Ann and I are going out with a, another couple that are friends of hers from work or something, oh, let's go see a movie. Oh, well, there's this one that's really, I hear is really good. Poor things with Academy Award winning Emma Stone. And we get in there. It's like whole lot of penetration. Yeah. I, then I, I get you uh, probably a, a little, um, probably feel a little bit uncomfortable. So I guess it all depends on who you are experiencing the filthy with. Well, definitely if you're in there, if you and you're like your sister decide, Hey, we're late. Like, hey sis, let's grab dinner. We haven't seen each other in a bit. Okay. And let's go see a movie. I hear the new Emma Stone movie is pretty good. And then you're sitting there with your sister with a lot of sweat and thrusting happening on screen. That could be very uncomfortable. I am. You know what? I remember. I'm not going to tell that story. Actually, <laughs> I was about to tell a story. I've just thought better of it and I'm not going to tell that story, but yeah, I can, I get you. I totally get you CJ. I really do that. Um, there are definitely situations where you could be made to feel uncomfortable watching it going on screen. Absolutely. It all depends on who you're with there. All right. Next up, uh, Murray Reich writes, I know Apple is worth billions. Actually, Apple is worth trillions. They're, they're worth $2 trillion. Um, but did they really think that making these big budget movies would be so profitable in the long run, especially with their bloated runtime like Killers of the Flower Moon? Well, again, you know, their strategy is not the traditional strategy, right? Their strategy is they are primarily making these movies to, number one, get prestige for the brand of Apple TV plus, right? This is a prestige platform. Number two, to bring attention to Apple TV plus in a world where like Max, Disney and Netflix get all the attention. And number three, to position their properties that when they do hit the streaming service, have more success than they otherwise would have. Apple's strategy right now seems to be investment. Like it's not about making movies right now that make profit right now. It's about laying a foundation that's going to lead to an overall reputation for our service and long-term success. To do that, you got to pour investment into things right now. And so it's going to be very interesting. I think it's a very bold strategy and it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out for them. Not this year, but over the next three or four years. And we'll see how that kind of uh, works out for them. Anyway, uh, thanks for that, Murray. Appreciate that, man. Next up, uh, we go to Kevin's, who sends in a $50 super chat. Kevin, thank you so much, man, for supporting our channel on that level, man. Really appreciate that. That's very generous. And Kevin's writes, hey, John, I'm curious to know who are your top three favorite characters from DC and Marvel, respectively. All right. So here's the thing, Kevin. I don't do top five, top three, top 10 questions because that makes me have to sit there. And the, those are the types of questions that I like to just sit down, think through, and maybe I'll do a video about sometime or a topic. But once I've had a chance to sit down and actually think it through and whatever, that being said, um, on the DC side, at the risk of sounding boring, on the DC side, it really is the Trinity. I mean, Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman. I mean, they're they're. I think they're the best characters DC has. Um, I've always loved them. I think they're great. And as far as Marvel goes, now if we're talking about the comic books, not the movies or the TV shows, if we're talking about the comic books, on the Marvel side, I'll at least let you know this that my all time favorite comic book character, all time favorite comic book character, not 
just hero, not just villain, not just from Marvel, not just from DC. My overall favorite comic book character is Magneto. Um, Magneto, I think, is a fascinating, incredible character um, that I have... I, I, re- I mean, I always liked Magneto, but back when that iconic storyline of Age of Apocalypse came out, that's when he really became my totally favorite character. And he's very misunderstood within his world and his universe. He's, he's a great example of the best intentions don't always lead to the best actions, things like that. He can be a great hero. He can be act very evil. I mean, just he's a fascinating character and that's my favorite comic book character overall, man. I, as far as who'd be my number two or number three or stuff like that, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to think about that. I mean, Hulk is certainly right up there. Captain America is certainly right up there. Um, a bunch of them, but, but Magneto, Magneto. I love Bishop. Um, yeah, but Magneto, Magneto's the guy, man. Again, Kevin, thank you so much, dude. That is an incredibly generous super chat. Thank you for supporting our channel at that level. We all deeply appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Jesus Gastelum writes, Um, Hey, John, hope that you're having a good day so far. I'm actually having a great day. Thank you. Uh, Did you see James Gunn's post today on Instagram talking about the inspirations behind a Superman film? No. Uh, Thanks and keep bringing the filthy. Yeah. um, Let me throw this out there. If if you guys are ever going to write in a question and ask, hey, John, did you see this? Also mention what it is just in case I didn't see it. You know, did you see James Gunn's Instagram post where he talked about Superman being inspired by Star Trek and Star Wars? I, again, I'm sure he didn't say that, but um, throw that in there too. So I'm able, so if I haven't seen it, I'm able to give some kind of response because unfortunately, Jesus, no, I, I have not seen his Instagram post today. So I don't know what to say <laughs> um, other than, other than, um, uh, Oh, let, let's see. E E R A is saying in the uh, live chat um, that says the post was of a comic page where Superman helps a suicide teen from jumping off a building. Oh, and and then did he say that that's part of the like that panel is part of the inspiration of the thing? If so, I th- I think that's awesome. Like. Because one of the complaints that people have, again, Man of Steel is a masterpiece of the comic book genre. Um, But even though it is a masterpiece, one of the the things that a lot of people, that, that a number of people would complain about with the Man of Steel Superman was, like Rob would point out, a lack of joy, whatever, but like a real sense of hope, right? Like it's a very grim, a darker, grimmer, reality that Superman in the world of Man of Steel has to contend with. But this idea about the Boy Scout, I mean, that just the hope, the doing good, whatever. And I think something like that would be really cool. So I did not see it myself, um, but I I just, I cannot wait to see what James Gunn brings to Superman. I'm I'm really very excited about it and very hopeful, if you don't mind me saying. All right. Uh, Next up here. Thanks, uh, Jesus. Appreciate that, man. Jared Oberfeld writes, uh, Rust Armorer has been found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Yep. Uh, we're going to talk about this on the John Campy Show tomorrow. For those of you who haven't heard, you remember that, that movie that Alec Baldwin was starring in and was a producer of where the cinematographer sadly got killed because some idiot put an actual bullet in what's supposed to be a prop gun and she ended up dying. Um, uh, uh, listen, I'm not trying to be an Alec Baldwin defender, but I think it's utterly ridiculous that Alec Baldwin's being charged. Um, there are people whose responsibility it is, especially the armorer, to make sure that anything that's handed to an actor is safe. Alec Baldwin was handed a prop that, number one, is supposed to be safe, and when handed the prop weapon, was told that it's a, it's cold. That means it's he was told by the people responsible for it, this is a totally safe thing we've just handed you, Right? It is not the actor's responsibility to become weapons experts. And with the right staff in place, people whose jobs and responsibility it is, 
who is supposed to oversee this stuff, then hand him a prop and, and then explicitly tell him this prop has been inspected and is totally safe. Totally safe. You were just been handed a toy, basically. It's a prop. It's totally safe. The armorer said so. So the armorer clears it. Then it's given to the assistant director. The assistant director looks at it. And then it's handed to Alec Baldwin. What happened was an insane tragedy. But there is no way in hell that he should be held responsible for the mistakes that obviously other people made. Um, it's like... Here's my MX3 mouse that doesn't work anymore. But let's say I didn't realize that the battery inside, that somebody else handed this to me and said, oh, hey, here's this is a totally just safe dead mouse. It's, it's, it's just dead. It's whatever. But little did I know, because I'm not a mouse expert, that a battery inside is actually leaking and is actually building up pressure and is going to explode the next time somebody hits this button. I mean, I have, there's no reason I should know that. And the person who gave it to me said, ah, it's just a dead mouse. And I give it to you as a gift. Here, you think you can do something with this mouse? See if I can get it to come into focus. There you go. Think you can do something with this mouse? Here, then I'll give it to you. See if you can do something with it. And you get it and you click the mouse and it explodes. Boom. Is that my fault? No. Obviously, it wasn't my fault. Maybe the person who gave it to me and told me it was totally safe. Maybe it was their fault. I, I don't know. But at any rate, the news came out that the armorer, the person whose job it was to inspect and make sure all the fake weapons were supposed to be completely safe, they have been found guilty of... Uh, of this. And, you know, I, I keep hearing this. Uh, Laura Howard is writing, I disagree, John. He pulled the trigger and he was uh, her boss as a producer of the film. Yes. And as the producer, he did the proper thing by hiring an armorer. He pulled the trigger because he is an actor and he was handed what was told was a completely safe prop. A completely safe prop. Here's what I would say it's like an unto lore. Let's say you're, you're cooking. Somebody sells you, you buy some uh, kitchen knives and you're told these are standard. It says right on the box, standard, regular kitchen knives. And a, a store salesman sells you these knives and you buy them. You're like, great. And so you're at home now using the knife, but you didn't know what they actually sold. Let's pretend this is a knife. What they actually sold you was a knife that if you press the handle a certain way, the blade will shoot out. And you're sitting there preparing dinner and you've got a neighbor over and you're talking to your neighbor and then you press on the handle a certain way and all of a sudden, something you didn't think this knife is supposed to do happens. The blade springs out of the knife, shoots across the room and it stabs your neighbor in the face. Is it your fault? Is it your fault? Or is it the fault of the people who sold it to you in the first place telling you that this was a totally normal, safe, regular kitchen knife? Or is it your fault because you're the one who's using the knife? Obviously, it wasn't your fault. You thought you were led to believe, you had every reason to believe that what you were just handed was a totally safe, very regular knife. That's all you were told. And it's completely reasonable that that's what you assumed. And so you were using it as a totally regular knife. Then all of a sudden you press something and the blade shoots out and it kills somebody. It's not your fault. You were the one holding the knife. Yes, but there is no way anybody would expect that you would think that this has a blade that's going to shoot out of it and stab somebody across the room. Alec Baldwin is the producer of the film, hired an armorer. It was their responsibility and it went from the armorer to the assistant director and then it was handed to him and he was told, now let's pretend this, <laughs> now let's pretend this hard drive is no longer a knife, it's a gun. And he was told, this is just a prop. This thing you're, I'm handing to you is completely safe. That is what he was told. And that's what it should have been. There never should have been a live round of ammunition on the thing. So yes, he used it. He pulled the trigger on it because it was a prop. He's making a movie. He's supposed to pull the trigger. There is no way in hell he should have thought there was a live bullet in it, especially when other people whose job it is to inspect these things hand it to him and say, 
nothing to worry about. This thing is completely safe. It's not his fault. It's, it's not his fault. Um, it, it, it's just not any more than it would have been your fault if you bought what was you were told was a regular knife and then while using it to cook dinner, the blade shot out and shot somebody. You had no, re, there was no reason you should have believed that there was even possible that would happen with that knife. So no, no, I'm sorry. I've yet to hear one valid argument about how uh, Alec Baldwin should be criminally charged for doing something that you and I do every day with various things. But if something in our hands is not what we were told it was, it's not our fault. Anyway, that that's just kind of my signal. That. Anyway, the armorer has been found guilty. The person who is actually responsible for that weapon, the person who is actually responsible for telling not only saying that this gun was safe, but then telling Alec Baldwin that this is a completely safe movie prop. This is nothing more than a toy that you're holding now in your hands. The person responsible for that has been found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, which obviously it's involuntary manslaughter. The armorer never wanted to hurt anybody. That was not their intention, but it is their responsibility. Um, so uh, anyway, Chris and Rob and I will discuss this tomorrow. Maybe there'll be a debate. Maybe there won't be a debate, but, um, we're going to discuss this tomorrow and, uh, we'll, you know, now, and, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Alec Baldwin now, you know, at first they, they charged him, and then they did the right thing by dropping the charges. And then for very political reasons, as has been reported heavily, they decided to charge him again. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I, again, maybe new information comes to light that we're not aware of yet. Like, I, I don't know. Maybe, listen, I have no reason to believe this, but what if we found out that, I don't know, the week before somebody gave Alec Baldwin a gift of live bullet ammunition and Alec, like just as a memento for making your Western, here's like, here's an actual box of bullets. Maybe somebody gave him that as a joke, little gift. And he was like, cool. And he accidentally left it with the prop guns. And it's actually his fault that there was a live round there. I don't, I'm just making that up by the way, but I don't know. Maybe there's more information that will come to light that will make it appear that it is more Alec Baldwin's responsibility. We'll find out when the court case happens, but uh, until then, it'll be interesting to see how that all goes. All right, next up, uh, we've got Kevin's, again, sending in a $20 super chat. Thank you, Kevin's, again, man, for your support. He writes, I wholeheartedly agree with you that Daniel Day-Lewis is the GOAT. Uh, is it the way he changes his voice or is it the way he's unrecognizable in every role he plays? Can't put my finger on it, have a great day. For me, I mean, what makes any great actor a great actor will vary from performer to performer, right? Like the things that makes Anthony Hopkins a great actor might be different than the things that make Gary Oldman a great actor or make Denzel Washington a great actor. All of them have different attributes that propels them to a, a, a status of greatness that not all, but most of us kind of acknowledge. I think with Daniel Day Lewis, um, for me, it is the way, whether you're talking about my left foot, whether you're talking about last of the Mohicans, uh, whether you're talking about there will be blood or gangs of New York or Lincoln or whatever it's, it's, or, or phantom thread. Daniel Day Lewis's ability to completely and utterly manifest a character with great complexity and totality. Like a lot of my favorite actors, like let's take one of my absolute favorite, my, my number one favorite guy in the business, Ryan Reynolds, right? Good Canadian kid. He's my favorite. I love Ryan. That being, and I think he's a great actor. If you don't know how good of an actor he is, go watch his film called Buried or watch his movie Definitely Maybe. He's a wonderful actor. That being said, 
In many of Ryan's movies, and this is part of the reason why a lot of people love him, but in, in many of Ryan's movies, it's part the character and part Ryan Reynolds. Deadpool is part the character, Wade Wilson, but also part Ryan Reynolds. His character in Hobbs and Shaw that he's in with Dwayne Johnson and Jason Statham is part that character and part Ryan Reynolds. And in a lot of stuff that Ryan does, and this is, again, this is a good thing because it's part of why people love him so much, but is part the character and part Ryan Reynolds. And I'm just using Ryan as an example. There's, there's a lot of great actors, like even Harrison Ford, who's a wonderful actor, but a lot of the characters that Harrison plays is part the character and part Harrison, because we love seeing Harrison in it, right? But with Daniel Day-Lewis, there's no Daniel Day-Lewis in any of the characters. It is a pure 100% manifestation of whatever that character is supposed to be. And Daniel Day-Lewis disappears. And there's just, and then not just is it is he just the character, but he brings life to the character, a depth to those characters, uh, an intensity to those characters. Um, that I believe that's what makes him the best he's ever that the best there's ever been. I, I respect that. Listen, who your favorite actor is is very subjective, and there's no right or wrong answer. I appreciate the Brandon you're saying, Leo. Leo's not top ten. Leonardo DiCaprio is not top 10. I mean, top 10 today, but Leonardo DiCaprio to me is not top 10 all time. Um, but to you, he is. That's great. Your opinion is no more and no less valid than mine. Uh, but like for me, I love Leonardo DiCaprio, but he's not, I, I don't think he's top 10 all time. He's absolutely awesome. He's incredible. But 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 I but I don't think top ten nothing nothing nobody has ever come close to Daniel Day Lewis like it's it's everybody and then there's Daniel Day Lewis you know what I mean it's it's just insane how far he is ahead of like everybody it's just it's it's amazing and it's funny because none of his movies are like my favorite movies of all time like I love there will be blood, but it's not in my top 10 favorite films of all time. I love Lincoln, but it's not in my top 10 favorite films of all time. I love last of the Mohicans, but it's not my top 10 favorite 10 films. Of all time. No, I'm just I'm talking about him as an actor. He's the Bret Hart of acting, man. The best there is best. There was best there ever will be. And again, it's all subjective. That's just my opinion, but uh, that that's why I kind of feel that way. Anyway, Thanks for that, Kevins. And again, thank you for supporting us on that level, dude. Really appreciate that. Uh, next up, uh, Spacey Casey writes, Hey, John, I just booked a trip to Toronto. Nice. My first visit, I bought a Maple Leafs ticket. How the hell did you afford that? Uh, but what is something else you'd recommend? See the lakefront, see the harbor, go to CN Tower, obviously. Go to CN Tower, partake of some of the great restaurants down there, all that kind of stuff. Listen, I'm not kidding. Like people in LA think I joke. They think I am in jest. And any of you who are watching in Toronto, back me up on this. Um, all my friends think I joke in LA when I say, if you think it's expensive to go to an LA Lakers game, try being a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Because I've got a friend, my buddy Jeff, lives in Nashville. He, my buddy Jeff is a really interesting cat. He's, uh, did I just say cat? What? Why did I say that? It's a perfectly legitimate thing to say. I've just never said that. Anyway, my buddy Jeff is a super fascinating guy. He used to do, um, like... He would buy little lights and then when people would be doing little little concerts and bars, they would hire him to bring his little light set up along and do lights for their shows. Well, now he has like dozens of employees, multiple millions of dollars of equipment, and he works with the biggest music acts in the world and he does their lighting design and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, he's based out of, uh, he's based out of Nashville and like, I mean this wholeheartedly to watch the Toronto Maple Leafs play is was cheaper for me to book a flight, fly to Nashville 
and watch them play the Nashville Predators in Nashville than it and get a hotel than it was for me to try to get a ticket in Toronto. Uh, when Ann and I were up in Canada recently, uh, we decided we got to see Leafs game while we're here. And like Ann was flabbergasted when the nosebleed of nosebleed seats, like far the upper right against the roof, way up in the back left corner, we're going for three or $400. Like it's, it's crazy. It is crazy how much it costs to try to go to the Toronto Maple Leaf hockey game. And again, it was, it's more expensive than trying to go to a Laker game. Unless you're talking about getting courtside seats. Don't lie. I, I looked up courtside seats for a Laker, a Laker game recently. It was 15,000 a ticket. 15,000 a ticket to be sitting, but that's to be on the court, to be sitting where Jack Nicholson would sit, right? To be sitting on court, to be sitting on the court. But still, like that was, that's crazy. But other than that, like other regular tickets, it's more expensive to go to Toronto Maple Leaf game. All right. Let's see. Next up, uh, we've got uh, Christopher Brickner who writes, people mention when watching Madam Web, you wash it down with soda. Cinemark sells alcohol. <laughs> if you're watching Madam Web, it's not soda you're drinking. Yeah, dude, listen, you know me, right? Like even in bad movies, after saying this is a bad movie, I will then try to find the positive. Like even in movies I love, I try to find the negative. And in movies that I really don't like, I try to also point out the positive things about it. Like no movie other than um, Battlefield Earth, Catwoman and Highlander 2, no movie, no matter how bad, is without any merit. And I'll tell you what, Madam Web... It, it, that, that one creates a struggle for me to try to find some positive. Like the basic idea of Madam Web is kind of cool. Um, what's what's the name of the guy uh, from Parks and Rec and Severance? Adam Scott. Adam Scott actually does a pretty good job in the movie. Um, so, but there are, there are some, there are some positive things in Madam Web, but I'm just telling you, man, the movie was so rough. It it was a difficult one to dig around for and try to find some positives because yeah, that one is one you'd, if you don't drink, like I don't, like I'm not a drinker, but that one might drive you to drink. Uh, it's just, woo, woo. Anyway. All right. One Luke, one, two, three, four says, You've often said that studios and coaches shouldn't listen to fans, but what about tech companies? Should they listen to what we want? It all depends on what you're, well, listen, you know what a great example of that is in the world of tech? Here's a great example. And I, I think this is great about, now listen, it's not that studios and directors shouldn't hear what fans want, but you shouldn't take direction from it. You know, this group of fans say they want this. Well, then that's what we better do. Like that's, that is, there's a reason those people are saying that aren't professional filmmakers. But in the world of tech, here's a great example of this. When they made, when Steve Jobs put out the iMac, re remember the iMac? Let me, let me see if I can find a good picture of the i. um, let me see if I can find a good picture of the classic iMac here for any of you who may not remember it and the glory that was the iMac. Um, so remember this guys, remember that the iMac, when the iMac came out, what a lot of people forget was at the time, the number one, mode of besides an internal hard drive of storage was the floppy disk. You guys remember that? Let's see if I can find that. Uh, let me see if I can find a pic for those of you who may not remember, but yeah, there it is. Oh, the bane of a lot of people's existence, the floppy disk. That was the number one way to store and move around information. And when they introduced the iMac, they didn't put a floppy disk drive in it. 
They didn't put a floppy disk drive in it. And a lot of people at the time were like, you are crazy. I use floppy disks. This thing's going to be a bust. Where the hell am I supposed to put my floppy disk? But here's the thing. Steve Jobs knew. Um, he had the foresight to know that, you know what? Floppy disks aren't the answer. And even though all the consumers are saying they want something to have a floppy disk drive, we know that's not the answer. And he didn't put a floppy disk drive in it. Even though everybody said that they wanted one in it, even though everybody said they should put one in it, he said, no, I, I just see the way things are going. This is an outdated technology. We're not going to put it in our brand new little computer. And guess what? The sales on that iMac thing saved the company. Save the company. Then here's another good example. Um, the number one selling thing that Apple had for a long time for a long time was this thing called the i the iPad Mini, not the iPad Mini, the uh, iPod Mini. It was the number one selling thing they had for a long time. And then I don't know, you guys remember this? For those of you who are old enough to remember this. The Nano. Thank you, John Vu. Not, not the, you're, you're hundred percent. John Vu is right. John Vu was saying it's not the, it wasn't the iPod mini. It was the, the Nano, the iPod Nano. Thank you. That's exactly what it was called. So the Nano was their number one selling thing that they had. And then out of nowhere, Steve Jobs killed it. He just took it away. He said, um, this, uh, this was good. This was great, but but where things are going is that. And people complained, how dare, how can you kill, how can you take away the number one thing that you guys are, are, are selling? How can you take that away? How can you kill that thing? Because he knew what the technology that was coming and all that kind of stuff. Again, Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, uh, uh, why am I freezing? Bill Gates, um, you know, they, they, of course, part of that is having your finger on the pulse and really being able to discern and interpret what it is that the, the customers or the audience will respond to, but knowing that you're the one who's got to be able to want to make that discernment and go, even if that's not where the consumers or the audience think they want you to go. And uh, that's been... You know, the, the people who've been truly successful are the ones who've been, have been able to do that, have their fingers on the pulse of what the audience or the customers want and what they're going for. But then being able to see through what they say they want and being able to know what it will, what it is that they'll actually respond to. And that's a, that's a key difference, man. That's what, that's the difference between the great artists and the not. Because if all you're doing is manufacturing, um, if all you're doing is manufacturing what the, then all you got to do is put out a poll every week. Hey audience, um, who do you want to see Wolverine fight in his next movie? Well, the poll said 83% said they want to see Sabretooth. Then, then you're not artists anymore. You're just a production line. You're just a manufacturer. You're not actually doing art anymore. And anyway, yeah, that's just, uh, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent there. Sorry about that, but it is open mic. That's kind of what we do here. Okay. Uh, next up. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Zona Knights writes in Dune two, there was a scene where the worm is briefly not moving. Perhaps this is how they get everyone on for their long journeys. Yeah, maybe, but how do you get the worm to stop again? I'm not going to go into details on it, but in the big question about how does people get off the worm, how, or get on them? How do you get a worm to stop? I, I, that they didn't address that. All right. Rafe from state farm writes, uh, Miss Movie Club, I'll never forget the one hour uh, fight, flight experience from Denmark to Belgium while listening to the Captain America Civil War episode. Yeah, look, I, I used to love doing Movie Club. I used to love doing Movie Club. I used to love our hero show. I used to love doing best movie, worst movie and, and the other things we did like that. But the reality was that while I love them and while the people who watch them seem to like them, they took way more resources than what we got out of it. Cause like for movie club, you know, it was me, Rob and Ray. 
Each one of us would have to that week make sure we watched the movie again because it had to be fresh in our minds if we were going to do a movie club about it. So we had to watch it again. So that's like seven and a half hours of manpower right there, right? Two and a half hours for me to watch the movie, two and a half hours for Ray to watch the movie, two and a half hours for Rob. So that's seven and a half hours of manpower right there. We had to like then schedule an afternoon where we spent the afternoon. That's us being in studio, pay, me paying people to be there and all time and then doing all the stuff we had to do with it. And while I loved doing it, I just realized it was taking more of our resources, time and money than we were even getting out of it. Because like an episode of like movie club might generate 200 bucks for us, right? Might generate $200. Well, forget my time. I won't tell you how much I paid Rob, but just what I paid Rob was almost, if not more than what we were making out of the show. That's not to even mention how much time it was taking for Ray and I'm paying Ray for his time, how much of my time it took and energy and just, and then that was the truth about all of our shows outside of the John campus show that more resources were going into making best movie, worst movie than what we were getting out of it. More resources were going into making the weekly hero than what we were getting out of it. And I was working 14, 16 hours a day. And I realized, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I realized I was breaking my rule that I was, even though I said I never wanted the John Campia YouTube channel to be AMC movie talk 2.0, you know, I got, I got, I got caught up into the trap that, Hey, we're having success. Well, then we got to grow. I got to hire more staff. And at one point I had like eight people on staff, like a year and a half, two years ago. At one point we had like eight people on staff and we got to add more shows and we got to add more shows. And then we got to add more staff and add more shows. Then I realized that the, I had broken the promise I made to myself that I wasn't going to do movie talk to, I wasn't going to make AMC movie news 2.0. I wasn't going to make collider movie talk 2.0, but I realized that's exactly what I started doing. And it's part of the reason why I was getting stressed that we were spending money. We didn't need to spend uh, that. We were being unwise with the use of our resources and I was getting burned out. And I just said, can't do it anymore. And, and that's when we cut all those shows. So like, listen, I, I miss doing movie club too. I really like doing movie club, but it, it, it was a part of a thing that was just not healthy for me and not a good use of our time and resources. And like Canadian spring is saying, I have a much better work-life balance. Now I'm able to still do the show today because we made those changes. So yeah, we, we scaled back, we scaled everything back just got back to the fundamentals. Um, we even stopped doing the John Campia show as a live show for a while, but then YouTube said, we're going to start reprioritizing live. So we went back to doing it live again, but now we're really just focusing on that. Now we're just doing the John Campia show and, and, and open mic from time to time and, and an open mic from time to time, uh, you know, a couple times a week. And it's much more efficient use of our resources I am having a much better work-life balance now. I am no longer burnt out. Uh, I, you could probably tell I have a lot more joy doing what I'm doing now than than I was, say, about a year and a half ago. Um, so, yeah, I, I miss that stuff too. I do. But it it's for the best. It really is for the best. But that's not to say we'll never do a special movie club here or there just as a fun one-off or something. Maybe we will from time to time, but... Yeah, I will never again let myself fall into the trap of trying to recreate AMC Movie Talk 2.0. I'm never going to fall into that trap again because it's not what I want to be and uh, it's not what we're going to be. All right. Uh, next up, Jason Weeby writes, Hey, John, currently watching Star Wars for the very first time. Nice. Just watched Revenge of the Sith last week. Um and even though I know it was going to happen, wow, that ending was tragic. Four out of five for me. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I think Revenge of the Sith is a steaming hot pile of garbage, although admittedly the least offensive of the prequels. Like, out of the three horrible disaster films that are known as the Star Wars prequels, Revenge of the Sith is the least offensive. It's the one... Remember how I was just saying, even in bad movies, I try to find the good? The Revenge of the Sith 
has the most redeemable elements out of the other ones. Certainly more than Attack of the Clones, certainly more than The Phantom Menace. Uh, it has a, a bunch of upside, a whole lot of tragic, shitty downside, but it is what it is. But it's also subjective. There are a lot of people who were like the Star Wars prequels were their first introduction to Star Wars. And if there are people who like it, like yourself, then great. I mean, awesome. That's wonderful. I mean, I, I hate them. I think they're garbage, but that doesn't mean you have to think they're garbage, nor does it mean I should think any less of you because you happen to like something I don't. Not at all. I love that you love it. I wish, I hope, I want everybody to love every movie they watch. I really do. I mean, that's not realistic, but I would love for that to be the case, for people to get joy out of the things they watch. And if I don't get joy out of something, I would never hope that you don't get joy out of it. That's, that's one of the big problems in film fandom these days is that um, <laughs> best Duel of the Fates, John, Duel of the Fates, Duel of the Fates is awesome. Don't get me wrong. Like, I hate The Phantom Menace, but that is a definite good side. That's a definite pro thing about that movie. There are several pro things. The, the pod races, I think, are great. Obviously, the Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, Darth Maul fight is great. You know, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, one of the big problems in movie fandom is people get threatened if other people like something they don't like. Because for, for some reason, they feel like if you like something I don't like, you're attacking me. Or if you don't like something I do like, you're attacking me because you're, by liking something I don't like, you're saying my taste is wrong. No, it's not. Not at all. Movies are experiential events. We all have different experiences with art when we encounter it. And I want you, like, listen, obviously I hate Madam Web. But when, if you're, if you tell me right now, you're about to go see Madam Web for the first time, I would probably warn you against it. But if you do go to see it, I will honestly hope that you love it. Cause you loving it doesn't take away from the validity of my opinion that I disliked it, nor would it add to the validity of my opinion that I disliked it. If you disliked it also. And if you're going to spend your time and money to go have it, I hope you have a good experience. Even if I don't. And I think that's a big problem in movie fandom today, particularly online. There's, there's a lot of outlets, blogs and podcasts or YouTube channels that are just, you need to hate this. And if you don't hate it, then we're going to attack you too, because you should hate it. And if you don't hate it, then you're a shill or you're whatever, right? Whatever children <laughs> go, go back to being children. Um, Real grownups know that, hey, you can love, I hope you love what I don't love. And if you hate something that I do love, that just means you had a different experience with it than I did. And it doesn't take away from the validity of me loving that. Anyway, that's just a kind of my take on that. So um, yeah, listen, if you liked The Revenge of the Sith, I am honestly, legitimately really happy that you did. Uh, I did not, but I'm glad that you did. All right. Rav writes, I would like to see a Denis Villeneuve directed Terminator. Well, I mean, let's be honest. He's one of the best directors in the world. I would love to see him direct anything. And quite frankly, I'm over Terminator movies. I, I, I am, I am quite frankly, Terminatored out. I, they've been so bad for so long that I, I'm okay not to see another Terminator movie for quite a while. That's just me though, Rav. All right. Murray Reich writes, uh, if not for Dune 2 being delayed to 2024, we probably wouldn't have gotten any big tentpole films aside from the DOA Madam Web till Ghostbusters on March 22nd. Uh, is this all because of the strike aftermath? Well, I mean, I, the Dune thing is definitely because of the strike aftermath, right? Like Dune got delayed because actors weren't available to go out and promote the film. And when you have as many A-list actors in the movie as they did, that's a pretty big deal. There were other films that didn't have nearly as much recognizable talent in their movies. So not being able to go out and promote them wasn't as big of a deal, but for Dune it was, and that definitely moved it out. Um, but listen, we've got some big high profile stuff coming, just not in the next few weeks. And, and yeah, man, listen, the, the writing and director strike, not to mention, the, listen, to a degree in the Hollywood pipeline, 
we are still experiencing some of the after effects just of the pandemic. And that was now years ago, right? So definitely there's still some of it and we will feel it for the next year or two. Uh, the actual effects of the delays that were caused and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, man, it's, it's very much still a reality uh, right now, Murray. How much on each individual film will be different from film to film, but it's definitely a part of the reality. All right. Uh, let's see here. King Daddy Go writes, uh, do you still believe App Apple will buy Disney one day? I still believe it's a possibility. I, I still believe it's a possibility. Listen, the reality is Apple has enough money to buy and sell Disney five times over. And if they're dead serious about really becoming a dominant player, one of the dominant players in the world of media it's a lot easier to buy a company like Disney than it is to try to build it for 10 years. I, I, so will it happen? I don't know. Like Bob Iger has been starting to rebuild everything at Disney and their stock price. Like Rob mentioned today, their stock price is going back up and everything seems to be coming, getting back onto solid ground. And it, it's going to take a while longer for them to get there. So maybe it's less likely today than it was six months ago, but I still believe it's a possibility. I know that's not a popular thought, but I still think it is a possibility. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is up to each individual person to decide, but I think it's possible. All right, AC23 writes, John, will MI8 be the last? I think so. Uh, if so, do you think they'll kill Ethan off? I love the franchise and hope for more. <sighs> I'm going to say no, and here's why. There is a creative argument to be made that Maybe Ethan should die. He's done his last mission and, and maybe he should die. The reason I don't think they will kill him off is because even if they decide MI8 is the last, I think Tom Cruise will probably say, listen, I have no intention of doing another one, but just in case two years from now, three years from now, an idea hits me. And I want to do it. So I don't think they'll kill him off because I think even if Tom Cruise decides he's done and maybe never does do another one again, I think Cruise will want to keep the door open just in case he changes his mind. Uh, so that's, that's, I could be wrong, but that's what I think. All right. Next up. Um, DJ's world writes, what's more likely you saying Mahomes is the goat uh, with less than seven rings or a live action Batman Beyond being made, released and up for best picture. Oh, that that's far more or less likely. Now, listen, Mahomes doesn't need to have seven rings like Tom Brady does. But I think minimum he's got to have five. And he's got to show he can win without uh, Coach Andy. Because there's always going to be the question. Because, you know, Tom... Uh, one of the big questions marks about Tom was Tom Brady was that, well, he can only win if he's got Bill Belichick as his coach. Well, guess what? He will change teams, won a Super Bowl again. Um, so he's got to show he can win without coach Andy. He's got to show that he can win without Travis Kelsey. Um, he's got to show that he can win with kind of a different lineup because Tom Brady won Super Bowls with like three entirely different New England Patriot teams. Like entire, like in like entire roster turnovers. And he still won Super Bowls. And he then went to another team and still won another Super Bowl and broke all these records and all this kind of stuff. Patrick Mahomes doesn't have to win seven to get to the to become the new GOAT. But he has to do a lot more than he's done so far. Uh, do things that he hasn't had the opportunity to do yet. Like show that he can win without coach Andy show. He can win without Travis Kelsey show that he can win with an entirely different lineup on the team show that he can have longevity show that he can stay excellent even in his 10th year and on. So he hasn't had the chance to show that yet. So, but you know, in 10 years, if he has like five Super Bowls. And has won a couple of those with entirely different rosters and with different coaches and maybe even on a different team, then he can be in that conversation. He doesn't have to have seven Super Bowl wings. He doesn't have to have seven Super Bowl rings to do that. But he's still a long way off. He's still a long way off right now. 
But let's have this conversation again in 10 years because it could be a very different conversation in 10 years. So let's see what happens then. All right. Uh, next up. Uh, Brennan Gleason Al Ghaib writes, um, saw Dune 2 again last night. Love the Paul slash Chani uh, RPG scene where Paul distracts the heli sniper. He looks back at Chani and the camera pans to bomb. Yep, again, but I'm not going to go into details about it because I don't want to spoil it for people who, uh, who haven't seen it. But that is just one of many awesome scenes in that movie, Brendan. All right. Next up, James Wheeler sends in a $20 super chat. Thank you, James, for supporting us in that level, man. And James writes, hello, John. Like you, I also love Shogun. Have you ever seen uh, Sonata's earlier film, Twilight Samurai? I have seen much of uh, Sonata's stuff, but I have not seen Twilight Samurai. Um, I'm not even familiar with it. Give me a second here. Uh, let me look it up. Uh, Twilight Samurai. Okay, so what was it? Oh, the poster's awesome. Oh, this is an older one. This is like over 20 years old. I assume this is the one we're talking about. Uh, if this is the one we're talking about, I am not familiar with it, to be honest. That's a badass looking man right there. He's also a... That's a handsome son of a bitch, too. Hiroyuki Sonata is a handsome son of a bitch. He still is. But yeah, no, I, am, I'm, I have not seen this movie. I have not seen this uh, particular movie in, in, in general. I've seen a lot of it. He's incredible. He's absolutely phenomenal. Love this guy. And he's so good in Shogun. I hope it stays as good as it is right now. All right. Thanks a lot for that, James. And again, thank you for supporting us on that level. That's really generous of you, man. All right. Next up, we got to wrap it up soon because my voice is starting to go. Uh, C or Captain Kirk 1978 writes, this past month, February, I did a rewatch of the X-Men trilogy and the Jurassic Park trilogy and doing a rewatch binge of Star Trek Voyager on season three. You know, Voyager, well, not as, certainly not as good as Next Generation and, cert, and, and, and arguably not as good as, say, Deep Space Nine. Voyager, I think, is an underrated show. It's, I think it's fair to say it, it's probably the weakest of that era of Star Trek shows, but it gets no attention. It gets no love. Voyager gets no love. And I thought they had a, a really interesting group of characters like Bolana and like all the rest of them and, and Paris and, and the dock, the, the holographic dock was really cool and all that kind of stuff. And a very satisfying ending with them finally getting home. Uh, it's an underrated one. Again, not, not the, not the as good as some of the others, that thing, but I thought it's a little bit underrated. I'm glad you're doing a rewatch of it. All right. Next up, uh, Bruce Lum writes, I've noticed that Hamilton watches have two desert Hamilton. I've never heard of Hamilton watches. Anyway, I've noticed that Hamilton watches has two desert dune products in close collaboration with dune part two prop master. They're priced at 1700 to $2,500. Anyone interested for watches? Listen, I'll tell you what. I, I, you guys know, just by looking at me, I have no fashion sense whatsoever in the world. Like none, zero fashion sense. I have no sense of style. I, I have no sense of me. I'm useless when it comes to that stuff. I have never, ever in my life understood people buying expensive watches. Like, oh, I've got this Rolex, this $5,000 Rolex. Why? Because I've got this Samsung or what would, what would have been the brand name at the time? Uh, Texas Instruments. I got this $5 Texas Instrument digital watch that will do exactly what your $5,000 watch does. Tells me what time it is. Because unless that Rolex gives you a blowjob, which I'm pretty sure it doesn't. I ain't spending $5,000 on that son of a bitch. No way. Not in your life. Um, like, I, I certainly don't get it. And I only finally got convinced to even get like a, an Apple watch, like a smart watch, because it does a bunch of things. Like, it, it keeps me from having to pull my phone out. It gives me my notifications, tracks my steps, you know, monitors my heart rate, like my calendar reminders. Come. It does a thousand different things. So, yeah, a couple hundred bucks 
for that, I, 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 I can do that. I can do that. I've never understood any sane, rational person who's, I tell you the same thing too. It goes for women as well, because like Ann and I, we go into this gift shop and there's this bag. I don't know if it was, I don't think it was Gucci. It was a Louis Vuitton or something like that. One, one of these bags. It was, it wasn't even big. Okay. It was like the size of this Halls bag, right? This, this little, this little women's bag, right? Little women's bag. And it was $2,000, $2,000 for that does the same thing. A $5 plastic grocery bag that I got when grocery shopping does. Oh, you put some things in it and it carries them around. I'll never understood that. Again, I admit I have no fashion or style sense. I, I agree. I, I have none. All you got to do is look at me and you know, that's a band with no fashion sense or style sense. It's true. It's sadly true. But I know well enough not to spend $4,000 on a fucking watch. It does nothing but tell me the time. I know well enough that I don't need a $2,000 bag that could barely carry around a can of Diet Pepsi in it for $2,000. No way. No way. Oh, can't be. You're just cheap. Maybe I am cheap. But you know what I got? Rolex wearing guy. I got $5,000 more in my bank account right now because I'm not wearing that Rolex. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, okay. Sorry. Let's... <laughs> Let's keep going. I'll just never understand it. All right. Next up, Ray loves trench coats. Sends in a $20 super chat. Thank you, man, for supporting us on that level, dude. This is very generous of you. Writes, my friend owns a comic book shop. That's pretty cool. Last night, someone ran their car oh, right through the front of the store. One of his employees got hurt and needs dental work, but thankfully no one got killed. It was scary footage. I, listen, I, I every once in a while, like everybody else, I'll watch some of these like, like, biggest fail videos of like, like a car accident, but usually it's not where somebody dies or anything like that, but like wild things that happen in traffic or, and I see these videos sometimes of people like sitting in a cafe, like a security camera, people sitting in a cafe and all of a sudden like a, a, a truck, not like a semi truck, but like a, a pickup truck or something comes flying through the windows. It's like a, that is like one of the most horrifying things. Horrifying. I I'm so sorry that that happened to your friend. Um, so very sorry that happened to your friend. Uh, thankfully, nobody got serious. Like dental work. Listen, if you can have a car come through a window and into a room that you're in and the worst thing you're walking away with is needing some dental work. I mean, I, I trust, I know dental work is no fun, but I'm happy everybody's got their life. Nobody got permanently damaged. Um, that is some scary stuff, dude. And and all of my best thoughts to your friend and their employee and, and everything. That That's a horror, horrifying situation. Um, all right. Next up. Uh, Tony movie writes, I know you're friends with Brian Taylor and, uh, has he told you anything about the new Hellboy movie yet? Because his style and films that he's done get me excited. He had now, listen, I haven't talked to Brian in a bit, but let me, let me see if I can bring up, I'm not going to tell you what's in it, but I can tell you the, um, the, uh, 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 kind of thing he was telling me let me just see if i can bring this up because it's been a bit since he sent there's brian um yeah okay yeah so the last thing that i'm gonna hold it far enough back so nobody can tell what it says the last thing brian sent me we were talking about somebody that they had cast uh another person that they had cast for it and it very very excited about it now that being said, this text message exchange I had with Brian was like a little under a year ago. And I have, I, you know what? And I'm, I'm glad you reminded me. I should, I haven't texted him in like 10 months. Oh, so, so I'm going to text him. But um, for all I know, it's not happening anymore. Like for all I know, it's, it's not happening anymore. I mean, or he's right now getting scouting locations to shoot, or maybe they've shot it already. And I just don't know, but I'm glad you brought it up and I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to him and I'm going to find out what I can find out. Uh, but as far as other than the casting, 
there was a public announcement about one casting, but then he told me about this other one that I, that I don't believe has been made public. So I can't tell you what it is, but other than that, that's the last thing I heard. And that's almost a year ago. So I will see if I can find out anything more about that, that I would be publicly allowed to, to say to people, thanks for bringing that up. And thank you for reminding me that I've been a terrible person and not writing my friend back for that long. All right. Uh, next up, uh, the Richards arts and inspiration writes, uh, Aloha, dude. Would the greatest American hero work today? Absolutely. Are we so saturated with superheroes? Uh, a, a bumbling teacher with a power suit, no instructions. My favorite show, the Reagan era. Could it work today? I'll be honest with you. First of all, I have fond memories of the greatest American hero. One of the great intro songs to a look at what's happened to me. I can't believe it myself. I still remember all the words. Suddenly I'm upon top of this world. Should have been somebody else. Then how's it go? Du, 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 du. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. Anyway, yeah. The greatest American hero. I thought it was a better concept of a show than it was actually a show. But it was a show that was way ahead of its time. Way ahead of its time. So this guy, average guy, aliens take him and give him this suit that give him superpowers and he has no idea what to do. And it's really just a, a succession of him kind of bumbling his way through. I think that is something that it's, it's kind of like mystery men in the sense that I think mystery men was way ahead of its time. I think mystery men could be made today and be awesome. Um, cause it's more in its era. And I think a greatest American hero could work done better than the show, but I think it could work today. That's just me. All right. Uh, let's see here. Next up. AC23 writes, John, I got to disagree with you with the financial potential of Superman. I think it'll be profitable due to the newness of DC. Fans are interested. No, they're not. The small percentage of hardcore fans like me, like you, people who make shows like mine and watch shows like mine, we're interested, but we often forget we represent a small percentage. Now, look, is there potential is there potential for the new Superman to be very financially lucrative? Sure, the potential is there. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that it's impossible. The potential is there. But I'm saying this is more like a Batman Begins situation. The MCU or the DCEU was driven into the ground and its reputation is terrible now. Batman got driven into the ground by Batman and Robin and killed the franchise. Now you could have said back then, John, people are excited about Batman. Sure. But do not underestimate how many people were still turned off because of what happened before. And what happened? Batman begins came out and it made, didn't even make $400 million. It made like barely over 700 or, or a $370 million. A lot of people, that surprises people when I tell them that too. They, they still think like, oh, Batman Begins must have made like $800 million. No, it made like $370 million. Not because it wasn't great. It was great. Some people think it's better than The Dark Knight. But because people were not ready to give Batman another chance because Batman and Robin was so terrible, even though that had been years before. So it took making a great movie like Batman Begins so that The Dark Knight could be a billion dollar film later. I am simply saying that this is very similar to that. It doesn't matter that there are some people like me, like you, that are excited to see what James Gunn does with Superman. The reality is they had five years, eight movies of DC stuff not being what they wanted it to be. And they got tired of it and they stopped going to it. And it's going to take a little bit of time to win that audience back over just like it took them time to win the Batman audience back. There's a reason the first film only made $370 million. I mean, don't get me, 370 isn't terrible, but I'm just saying is there's a reason and it wasn't because the movie wasn't great. The movie was great. Batman Begins is great. But they knew they had to make a great movie so the later movies could be huge successes. And I think that's the situation we're in here. Could the new Superman 
make $700 million? Yeah, it's possible. That potential is there. I'm just saying, don't be unrealistic. I think the more realistic idea is that hopefully the movie's great and can make three to $400 million. And if it does that and it's great, then maybe the next couple of movies can make $700 million, $800 million, join the billion dollar club, but they've got to win the audience back just like Batman had to win the audience back. I, I, I just think the, sim this, the similarities between the two situations are very striking. And I think we just can't be unrealistic about it. Um, and you know what? <clears throat> That'll do it for today's installment of Open Mic. Only two and a half hours long. I really thought today's was going to be a shorter one, but it was still two and a half hours long. Hey guys, thank you so much for being here and joining me for today's show. I had a blast. Don't forget, tomorrow's going to be a fun one. We're going to have me for the first time in almost a year. It's going to be me and Rob and Chris on the show all at the same time. So a special show tomorrow. I hope you come and uh, join us for that. Obviously, we're going to be talking about the the rust shooting situation with the, with the movie sets armor being found guilty. we got a number of things lined up that we're going to be, actually, I'll tell you right now, some of the things we got lined up that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about, uh, Ming-Na Wen has joined the new karate kid. We got obviously the thing about, uh, the, uh, the armor being found guilty. There's a couple of other stories here as well. Going to be talking about that. Hopefully you guys will come back and join us for that. Big thank you to all you guys who sent in the questions, both on the tip link and in super chat, number one, because he gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, obviously you supported our channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the channel. Thank you guys so much for your support. Uh, so guys, thanks again so much. I'll see you tomorrow. My name's John Campia. And until next time, my brothers and sisters, filthy.